What's up, everybody? My name is Shiragam. I'm the host of the Hashishin. If you haven't checked out the podcast, you can do so on iTunes or Spotify. You can also check out our Instagram at the Hashish Inn, that's I N N, and our Patreon, which is patreon.com backslash the Hashish Inn. Welcome to the first video we've ever produced. Uh, we're calling this series Resin Talks. And on our first episode, we're going to be talking about air drying resin. Uh, we have some cool folks here. I appreciate everybody coming on. Uh, we got Camden from Pua Extracts. We got Brandon um, on Instagram at Kushkirk from the Garden of Greece. And we got Michael Macho Melts, which is just at Macho Melts, right, man? Yes, sir. All right, cool. Yeah, so feel free to check us all out. But yeah, we're here to talk about air drying resin today. So, you know, funny enough, I get a lot of questions uh, from people that listen to the podcast about air drying, even though it's something that's not super common nowadays. So I wanted to put together a panel of people that are, you know, good air dryers and just talk shop. Um, so again, I appreciate you all coming on. It's funny, you guys are somewhat of like a dying breed, you know, uh, people aren't really air drying that much anymore. And what's kind of funny to me about it is that, you know, water extraction or separation, whatever you want to call it, is something that's relatively new, you know, in the hash world. It's, you know, as far as I can tell, it's like doesn't go back any further than like the 80s, right? So adding resin to water has created a dynamic where now you need to get that water out of that resin, unlike any other time in history with cannabis resin. You know, so in a way, drying resin by just naturally letting it sit is kind of a new thing of its own. So I find that pretty, pretty interesting. And so I want to ask each of you, do you think there's a right and wrong way to dry resin? And we'll start with Camden from Pua. Right or wrong way to dry resin. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's definitely obvious like um wrong ways to dry resin you know if if the, it's not broken down enough uh but that just might be incorrect microplaning or incorrect sieving um i would say you definitely want to get it down to um i don't know at least like real small chrome sizes for the first drying of a sieving product and then to break it down continually as it dries too. But um, there's definitely incorrect ways, especially air drying, I, I would say. Well, probably freeze drying too, if plug in the wrong thing. Okay, cool. And Michael, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would agree completely what he said. Just, um, I mean, obviously there's traditional style press hash that, uh, I mean, plenty of people enjoy smoking, but a lot of people would say that's improper way of drying hash or it could at least be done differently. Um, I get asked a lot about people asking if they can dry on cardboard. Um, I personally would not dry directly on the cardboard. I would probably at least line the cardboard and parchment paper. Uh, just things like that. I mean, it depends on how, I guess, how in depth you want to go. And if you're really just being a hobbyist hash maker, or if you're um, trying to get more serious about actually like making hash, I guess on a cleaner level, but it can even be done on a hobbyist level to where it's exactly the same quality of resin that you could produce otherwise, you know, so. Right. How about you, Brandon? Yeah, add, to add, agreed with all of it and to add to it, um, you know, the right ways, making sure, yeah, your moisture level is um, wicked, I feel like, properly out of your material um, beforehand, too. Um, and to not you know not to leave it in big chunks you really want to space this out is kind of i think the most proper way to dry it. so to improperly do it is to not space it out as as much like camden was saying you really want to take these fine chunks and, or chunks and to make it finer and finer and finer so it does dry more evenly um much surface area as possible um so yeah. you know yeah, it's all about surface area. Really, if you take like, you know, anything bigger than a grain of rice, I feel like it has the potential 
or even actually half the size of a grain of rice has the potential to like hold that moisture too long and be a problem. So you really want to get them smaller than like half a grain of rice to start off at least. So like that's usually what the sieve does for most of us here. So, um, mm-hmm. and it's really just that timing of when to do that. That's, I feel like a big, you know, yeah. way, which way you're going to do it right now. Is it going to be right or is it going to be wrong? Because that's yeah. the fine line. You're on the fence in oh, between yeah. that time. And, and that's the thing, you know, um, that it's really we're going to s- discuss today for sure. Um, but it's so in-depth. And, and, like, yeah. So, yeah, just to Yeah, there's that. so many ways to make your job easier with sieving if you catch it at the right time, like you're saying, or just, like, in general. And, like, learning right. that, there's more – I feel like there's more experience with – learning how to air dry than there is at least with like figuring out how you can make your process as simple on you and as less stressful for you as possible um as right. opposed to like yeah. freeze drying hash you know um exactly you have to be innovated and like innovative and like um can adapt to the swing of things very quickly that's like a really good key and then you know you to, to be a good hash maker is to really fail a lot of these times to learn how to, you know, learn the swing of things. There is no textbook. There is no, you know, engravement on walls that we used to read. This is just strictly learn it as you go. And like, you've got to, you know, remember what you just did that you failed with. Cause a lot of shit goes on in one day. I mean, and then how many batches you make in a day, how many you make in a year, et cetera, et cetera. You got to just remember this stuff. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, like, it, and Brandon has a really good point. Like, you got to be able to react to something and know that it's going to react like that in a split second. Like, or, well, maybe not a split second, but you got to know that you got to be quick. But also, you have to know if you have to be really patient. Um, yeah. Because if something's not done and that shit's not, like, you know, ready to eat, like, it's not going to be good. So, yeah. um, but like, it's that, in, it's that like thing that you start to know after you process over and over again of a bunch of different cultivars, you kind of get to categorize them in different smells and put them together in groups on the way they're going to feel or like wick out moisture in the timing or, or uh, temperature they're going to need. Correct. Yeah, that's, like, that's very huge. Especially yeah. if you're not on the farmer standpoint at all for the resin you're washing, like that's huge with being able to logistically remember things like that down to knowing exactly like what, how you're saying flavor profiles like Kim's, you know, it's like a lot of those might have the same resin structure, similar trichome, like volatility, I guess you could say, or just like how it, how it reacts under heat, you know, pressure, everything that you're going to be, you know, working with, I guess, when you're trying to dry it, so hundred percent so yeah it definitely sounds from like what from all of you are saying is that there's like almost a field that you develop for like you said can different cultivars or just different styles of resin that it only comes with that direct experience of doing it over and over so my question to you guys is do you feel now that is basically what I would call the freeze dry era because most people dry, I think they're hashed with freeze dryers nowadays. Is is there still some importance to learning how to properly air dry? Does that somehow give you knowledge basis that you wouldn't otherwise have even if you can dry hash with a freeze dryer yeah, I think it does. I definitely think that you're kind of skipping out on a huge portion or like a, a portion of the hash making, like trueness of what it was and what it first started as, you know, there was never machines. Um, there was tools, but there wasn't machines. And I feel like um, having these machines detaches us, like just gets us farther away from what history and the, and the, the respect that I have for that, you know, like I hold it, but you know, I, I want the future to see that and other people and the consumers to know that it's like that too. And um, we got to give thanks for the people before us. Big time. And, and, you know, yeah, huge. This is, yeah. it goes down to ancestral, you know, respect. So um, 
you know, I think that's what I look at it as the highest part of hand drawing. That's like a gift that keeps on giving, you know, we don't have to rely I mean, what happens with all this world goes to shit. And, you know, freeze dryers aren't around anymore and might not be power to run the things, you know, there's things that we can still work then, you know, I, I know I could like, so yeah. all of this, it, it really goes to show you need to know these things. It's like starting a fire. I mean, you, do you know how to start a fire by hand out in the woods without a lighter, you know, like, no, but maybe it'll really help. Right. So it's like, that's, that's oh, yeah. the value of that, you know, in yeah. my eyes. So like, that's my opinion. I just yeah. don't think you'll ever have as pretty of hash as you would have air dried as well. Um, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm really biased towards flavor and things like that, and I I can only say that based off of experience with other freeze dried hash that I've experienced to be able to say that. So it's it's a different thing, but honestly, like like especially you, Cam, and I, I'm, and other people I could think of that were just like sieving hash it looked like straight caviar and it was just the most beautiful thing. And I feel like you can still have amazing freeze dried hash that has a, a whole lifetime of watching it go from way more, you know, a consistency of having separated trichome heads to just completely greasing over. And it's just, it's a fun process to watch either way, you know, but um, I've just always something about the look of air dried hash has just always been something to me, you know, uh, that's probably one of the biggest thing, one of the biggest reasons I still do it, I'd say. Yeah, I, I agree. I've always really just loved the like look of that caviar, like uh, bubble hash, you know, it's always just been something that's just absolutely fascinating. Low globe of like weed, you know, looking at that in pictures, it's just like, that's fucking awesome looking, you know, like it just looks delicious. Yeah, and I mean, in, in a way, you know, if you're not microplating and you're sieving, in a way, you're keeping the resin, I guess, truer to its natural form in a way. Right? 100%. I would agree. I've seen people say that, on, like, um, and put up apparently uh, macros of freeze dried hash and saying that it ruptures trichome heads, even just being under vacuum and pressure, and even just the cryogenic temperature, like, you know, the whole environment it's in. But I don't have much experience on that, so I can't weigh in on like how true that is. But I would agree, at least with sieving as opposed to microplaning. I remember that, like back when before uh, before freeze dryers were a thing, there was a bunch of memes that Fred Morris, if anybody knows who he is, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. and a few other people that were like microplaning. They would make funny memes about uh, <laughs> sieves and like mu like smushing heads through the sieve and stuff. And I thought it was always funny because I felt like more heads would stay intact through the sieve especially the the finer or like how fine of a sieve you're using especially multiple times i felt like more stayed intact than if you're straight slicing it through a zester but like i mean everything is it's it's what you want to achieve and everybody has for me it was just like i always told people if they wanted to start washing ash and just like growing uh cannabis or anything you want to grow it's like your experience is going to be different than anyone else and for you to find what works for you is like very important for you to be able to do it and actually like do it less stressful you know or like find what is your lane to channel and work with you know everybody's going to be slightly different with where they kind of go to achieve that, that and that's like, so. i think that's super important too because everyone thinks to come to us for answers but like our answers are not going to be the right like answers some of the times for you guys and yeah oh yeah that's huge yeah. you know like yeah so listen to that one everyone i just want you know that's <laughs> known definitely true. yeah it's it's Those like when you go to the grocery store, store and you try to tell them a problem and that happens you know it's like they can't help you so, they can only help you so much if you go to the grocery store and try to tell them what's going on in your garden they don't know the full environment of like of everything going on in your your totally. spot you're trying to grow cannabis at you know so absolutely yeah and so you know you brought up the the look as being one of the things that keeps you air drying, uh, Michael. And, but you also mentioned the flavor, you know? And so I'm curious, Brandon, I know you air dry, but you also use freeze dryer. And so mm -hmm. what's your opinion on, on the flavor profile between one and the other? Is there a difference? It's, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I'm pulling down the same plants and literally splitting. I actually will split the spoonful 
when I'm pulling it out the bag, I'll take, you know, a spoonful and I'll put it over here and I'll take a spoonful and I'll put it over there. And just to know, you know, it's the same shit. And by far the, the smoke exhale off of the hand dried is like, it's just the smoothest smoke that I've ever smoked. It's, it's, it's what I, you know, it's why I do it. And like, I can't really say that the freeze dryer is the same way. I always thought that the freeze dryer lingers and leaves like a percent of moisture still kind of in the hash. I don't know why. And I've had old freeze dryers and I just got new ones with the vacuum lit or the oil list. So I will say it's been a lot better since then. And I feel a lot more confident that it is that dryer, 100% dry, not 99 um, I have had one of the first freeze dryers and no one I knew around here in Southern Oregon had for me, one for me to look at. So I uh, ended up purchasing like the very first stock one. So I don't think that one was really that good. Um, but then, yeah, these new ones are great. And I s still can tell the difference though. Like it just being maybe more of like it just sits out you know i dry it out in the garage that i process in and then after i do that i jar it up and i usually let it you know hang out i'll smoke it in the, in the house or put it in the freezer um but the the freeze dryer kind of goes right into the freezer after it's like jarred up and i feel like maybe i even should start like re i, I do receive my freeze dry but i think i should let it even like sit out for a day in the room to even air dry some more I just feel like the, the smoothness can't be compared to a hand dry hash. Yeah. That's hands down, I guess, my answer. It's just like a little bit more of a, of like maybe a terp thing on the, like a terp choke or like a very terpy on the freeze dry, but it's just like as terpy, but smoother on the hand dry, if that makes sense. And I yeah. think you now it's because of like you were saying before, someone's just like the, the freeze dryer isn't, you know, it's not even meant to do that, you know, it meant to dry hash. It's like, we just, someone found out the tech and, you know, ran with that and I respect it, but it, uh, it's definitely a difference. So yeah, sorry, go on. <coughs> no, um, yeah, I've at least to oh. touch on that a little bit. I, um, the, like the same thing you're saying about on the throat, at least in my experience, I've noticed that, but I just always assumed it could have been that the hash was just under dried that was being freeze dried. Um, right. But didn't really right. know. Yes. And that's basically what you're saying, but in the sense of just not being able to fully achieve what you would be able, you're thinking you'd be able to achieve air drying, right. I guess, with and I, you know, dryness. And, hands, and, and yeah, guaranteeing and hands down, no one's ever said anything about the freeze dry hash coming out. And that's the, the stuff I give to the, cons like the customers and the consumers and all that. And no one's ever said, oh, dude, your hash is wet. Uh, you know, it's like really just me as a connoisseur. And you guys would know we can all sit around and really get deep into judging shit because right. we know it's, you know, we're looking deeper past this like front like layer of flavor or this or that. We're going deep, you know, and our lungs are used to it. So like it's, it's our lung. I, and I feel like when I smoke new people's hash, like my lungs can definitely tell I'm cheaping on my stuff a lot. And you guys know my, my, my practices of growing and like, so like I, that's why I feel like the smoothness really comes from just the sun grown, like good earth. So I, you know, can tell when someone really throws a curveball into, you know, a product just with something like just nutrient wise. But, you know, I definitely think it's the turp choke kind of comes from that not a hundred percent like cured you know resin that resin really wants to be outside i think and like oxidize and do its thing i mean it's, it's what's naturally wanting to do yeah. so i think that's got something to say about it it's really yeah. hard it goes deep it goes deep yeah definitely I, i've always wondered the other thing is the few times that i i freeze dried is something that i know it's just when you freeze dry it's in an enclosed environment and then when you bring it out in an enclosed environment um it, it absorbs the moisture within the air, including um, like drying fruit in, in the freeze dryer. If you leave that frozen, like freeze dried strawberry out, it begins to get that moisture and a little bit of stuff in it. Yeah. Yeah, but totally. Yeah. I think, I think what you're saying about like 
having the freeze dried hash out in the like regular environment that you are in um, and letting it like come to that uh, is the batches of freeze drying that I liked from myself. Um, but I, I just haven't had enough experience to, to fully know. Yeah, totally. And I mean, like yeah. we say, like every strain is really different. You got to take that, that same strain and do it 10 different ways. And you might find the way that one likes, but then the next strain will be different and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's really, you know, it comes down to what I'm sure we all can agree on, like some of the stickier heads, sandier heads, oilier heads. I mean, yeah. All of these react so different. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's no directions on like when to get a sandy head, what to do, you know? So maybe we could right. start making that as like a book. We should all write it together. That would be pretty freaking tight. And That'd sell a book sick. together, you know? And people <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, yeah dude for real this is dude, drop a bomb yeah. right here you know yeah, dude, dude. that'd be that'd be cool that'd be cool if it could be like can bible style almost or some shit yeah yeah you know i mean there's the jorge cervante book is the book that i first read on the growing and then in the end of it it's hash making and it's like it just stokes you up and gets you to do the whole thing and <laughs> doing you know doing that was just like it, it was it's good it's really good details on telling you what to do you know it's just not up to date maybe but right. still start with that and you'll start you'll be surprised on how much you could still like learn just from that and you know yeah maybe we just need to make an updated version really i yeah. think that'd be really cool of all of us like as writers in it yeah dude, no, i'm all like, for logistics on that we'll get that yeah we'll get someone me. to write it because we all are busy. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading uh, the the little kind of small excerpt part on water hash um, in Robert Connell Clark's hashish, and it's so like intriguing, man. Like, there's a part where they're talking about drying resin that's been through water, and they're like putting it in like some kind of cloth that sits over a towel, which that's not too unfamiliar from like what you guys are still doing. But then they're like taking that cloth and then wringing it out, like compressing all this resin and then like mm -hmm. uncompressing it, then applying heat to it and like <laughs> finger rubbing it to get the moisture. Like, you know, and this is like the authority and like hash almost this book. But like you said, Brandon, it's outdated, you know? Um, mm -hmm air drying has become a, a different and I, you know yeah i don't know what people really know if they were smoking like two percent moisture or you know a couple percent of moisture in your hash back in the day probably wasn't a damn problem you know it was it's totally different but nowadays so it's mold right right well i mean they might have not had little jars to put it in you know like this is a different era we're totally in and we're having jars with mason jar lids on, you know, and it's like this, this is sealed tight where air cannot get in and out. I mean, back in the day, I bet hash dried out hella hard. It was, you know, either crumbly or gooey, but it was, if it was crumbly, it was probably thrown right in your pocket, you know, shit. Yeah. Just to say, you know. <laughs> I used to know like a couple of people here in Portland when I first moved here that like, you know, they would make bubble hash, ring it out flatten it out and they would put in little fucking envelopes and then like drive over it back and forth and shit <laughs> and like be like this is the best and honestly when i was trying that that was the shit like it was so good you know and yeah. that's why like smoking a hash joint with you brandon is like the best it's that like old school hash flavor with with herb and stuff it's so fucking good oh um, yeah and I still love that stuff too, you know? And yeah, I guess that's not an incorrect way to dry things too. I guess it's just like, what, what are you get, trying to get out of it? Did you do right. it I mean, or not? <laughs> exactly. And I mean, it's not going to kill you. A little bit of moisture in a, in a hip rip won't kill you. It's way better than any like, you know, um, solvents, I'm sure still, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, it's a level of like who we are as people now. And now... Yo, someone get that dog. Um, <laughs> there's a level of of who we are as people now with like our you know standard of quality. You know, and no one will settle for some half-ass type of shit. So, 
Um, yeah. I don't blame it, you know, and there's – so now that's what it is. We have proven that we can get it to a certain level of, you know, caliber of quality, you know, that is achieved. Hmm. It's not impossible. You know, now it's just how possible is it to make it on a level that the whole world is not smoking, you know? Um, that's right. going to be hard because – like we said, what we started with is it's this like, it's, it's a deep passion that I think makes us be that hand dry type of hash maker, you know, that we started it like that and we'll still do it today, you know, and like when the freeze dryer is an option, like I do both and it's, it's just, you, you know, I can't, can't knock that. Like, and, and, and for something like myself, I, I got to keep it like just super true. You know, so I was going a little off right there. No, that's yeah. totally chill. Um, I actually, I actually had a question. If, if you notice in certain strains to where like, um, on the nose of it, of the hash is better on freeze drying or the same as sieving. I ha I mean, after how many I've done, I'm going to say they're pretty similar. Um, okay, the cool. one, the, the one thing is maybe the hand dried loses its turps a little bit quicker from the few that I've done just because honestly, maybe it was just, I can't say I opened the jar, each jar the same time, every time, yeah. you know, I might've smoked one more quicker than the other and things like <laughs> happen like that. Um, so that's the hard, hardest, like really, um, but huh. To say the the terps were almost like you know they still were amazing once you reheated it but mm -hmm. um yeah i think that was the only thing like it's too similar they really are both similar um yeah the only thing different i would have to add on to that and it's a little off topic but is uh hand rubbed hash that was Let's by see. far the loudest almost that i've ever smelled like Charis? Charis? Yeah, yeah from oh, yeah, golden dang. strawberries yeah. I did that, and that was Yo, like, that. from like just a fresh hash point of view and hand dried, um, like it reacted. It looked like hand dried hash. It had a little bit of oxidized. It was you know the same type of trans like transparent and gooey and all that, but it it was louder for like a longer time, Damn. and that's what I was like, "Yo, what are we doing? Like, we need to <laughs> we need to be pressing this quick." We, we need to just be rubbing, you know, as, as maybe the hash maker and, like, the cream of the crop. Like, take a portion and, like, rub your hands and collect a ball. And then Truly hand-dried hash right there. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's hand-dried. Hand that's, that's, that's just hand-dried. That's, that's the quickest way you could be Wait, getting so iry you, off the harvest. Are you talking, are you talking about fresh plants? That is the quickest way. Fresh plants? Yeah, 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 like straight up, like cool. how they used to do it in, you know, right. in, the, in the East. And, and, and they were just rubbing live plants. And they weren't, you know, they were seeded plants that probably had a very um, little bit of resin compared to our hash plants over here. Right. So, Absolutely. man, I was, I was DMing. This is a little off topic, but I was DMing one of those dudes over there um, in Pakistan or something and asking him, like, what's the, what do you usually get on your hands at the end of the day after working a full day in the field? And he said seven to 10 grams and that's a full day's work. That's Holy like eight, eight hours plus, you know? <laughs> and so what I did here is I timed myself and I did, I did my little B buds, my little C buds, like on the bottom <laughs> of the plant. I did it for two hours and I got two grams. It was amazing. So like the amount, I could probably easily get 14 grams to 20 grams maybe in a day's worth of work here. It's, and it's, quite amazing so i think just right off the top i mean we need to start trying that out as as uh hash makers i know it's hard when we don't have a square footage like you know you got to have square footage for that type of shit yeah sure. but that that sounds like a real true experience right there though yeah sorry Something i just wanted to add on even because money on it, that kind, it was kind of right? on my mind with the topic of the question being like if there's a difference which i you know i know there right. is and that is almost the biggest difference though when i've ever smoked all my like flavors in each way that one way that i did that one was by far like the loudest what do you think about effect though especially with the with the trichomes oxidizing like that as opposed to not, super you know. oh like way more in the body you know way more cbgs cbns um cbds so like 
I'm oh, pushing yeah. the plants, you know, to full maturity. And then we're like harvesting the A's and B buds, right? And then I'll let the little C buds go for an extra week or 10 days, maybe two weeks. Fuck it. And those things become big. And the soup, the resin, you know, really gets amber on those because those had shadow. Um, the canopy shadowed them. And now that they're fully exposed, it's like time to swell and a little sunburn almost. And it's like a good thing. It gets like really amber. It's really yeah, nice. Right fruit. Yeah, super fr- super sweet and oh, super, yeah. you know, heavy, heavy on the high. Damn. That would be great for people when anxiety is that shit, huh? Yeah, dude, right now, for sure. Yeah, dude. That's <laughs> why I always felt like old bubble hash was always so sleepy, you know? Like, I used to make edibles from it heavily, and I always just, later in life, I'm like, I just assumed it was just a lot of the THC degrading into CBN, and, um just having that more like kind of lost, especially like even an equilibrium, but just make you feel loopy. Like, cause if you don't go to sleep, you know, it just seems like it puts you to sleep. I have a buddy that's epileptic and like he has uh he smokes like a bunch of high CBM strains and tells me, he's like, yeah, I literally can't smoke these unless I'm done like with my work for the day, you know? Cause he's like, I'll, it'll literally just put me on the couch, put me to sleep. So. Yeah, dude. I agree. Wow. So, one thing that we really haven't talked about is environments and it kind of was brought up a little earlier and each of you, I think has kind of a unique situation. Brandon, you mentioned earlier, you do your drying just cause I've been at your place and I've seen your, your setup and you do your drying kind of like in an outside barn, depending, which is obviously dependent on the weather. Camden right. is kind of a much more like it, controlled environment and uh, macho. I'm not sure. So, how about we start with you? Uh, it kind of depends the time of the year, really. Um, since I'm in Michigan, it's colder a lot of the times of the year. So um, most of the year, I can get away with just kind of venting a room and running a HEPA filter and a DHU in a room and keeping it below 40 degrees, you know, uh, if it's that time of the year. But, yeah, just a bedroom basically is what I'm doing right now with a cool bot if I need to run a window unit. I'm just basically running a window unit in a room um, just off of a cool bot and then just have a DHU in the room. Basically okay. just pretty simple insulated room. And you said you're, you're trying to keep it down to 50? <clears throat> yeah, I try to stay around, honestly, like, I mean, you could dry hash, I feel like at 60 under and get similar results. Just certain, certain strains are going to be definitely harder to work with and, it definitely depends on what depends on what you're trying to do as well. Like if it's going to be harder to probably work with that stuff and and keep it separated if you're going to squish it or if you're going to keep it for water hash, if you're okay. just going to squish it all into rosin, then it's probably less of a hassle to have to worry about the hash. I would assume, I don't, I mean, um, but yeah, I would say, I would say like most hash, I like to dry around mid forties and somewhere if you can keep it in that 20 to 25 to 35% humidity is, pretty key yeah and camden um so we actually dry in a similar environment uh where it's a cool bot and uh ac split and um yeah a pretty small room and a dq um it's pretty much just always introducing cold air usually mid 40s is what we can get it down to in the winter it, it can get down to like low 40s um and then just always have the dehu going on and um you know try not to wash more stuff as other stuff is drying you know to introduce any new uh humidity but um yeah we just try to get the humidity down as as much as we can and keep on blowing cold air in there um because we're in like a warehouse setup so like we're not blowing like fresh air in when it's cold out so it's kind of like in the back um but yeah just trying to blow cold air in and keep it dry and uh when, once the the session of making batches is done just let it dry all the way until you start making any more hash yeah so you said the lowest you guys get it down there is 40 depending on the time of year yeah 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 because um yeah i mean eventually like the low 40s with continual cold air just starts to get uncomfortable if you're 
like even if you're fully clothed up and stuff it, it can eventually just like I don't know, it'd just be, like, really fucking cold because it's just new cold air on you all the time. If it's a small space or something, you know? Yeah. And then, Brandon, your situation, like I said, is a little dependent on the weather. So how do you deal with that? Or do you just kind of let it ride? Um, sorry, it went and said I low battery for a second. So, um, what was the question? How I... So how do you deal with the kind of fluctuation in temperature oh. and humidity, like variables in your situation? Okay. So yeah, um, like Pua said, try not to um, bring more moisture into the room. So if like I'm doing the hand dry, like I'll close the room down. I have a garage door on the one side of my um, like 25 by 20 or 30 space, you know? And uh, so I have that open. Um, during the day, like as I'm washing, cause I like walk right out there and I'll clean the bags and all that. So the air outside in the winter time is roughly pretty dry, um, in the winter actually here, um, in Southern Oregon, especially in the, my little Valley. So I get away with having like the same numbers that they just said, like around, it could be as cold as 35, maybe sometimes 30, nice. um, just outside and the per, and then the dryness as soon as I'm done with the wash that day and I'm and I shut the garage door I have like a pretty big industrial dehue um you definitely need a dehue and I have like eleven hundred dollar dehue just to, for this like one space that's like square footage wise it does a space that's like twice the size so gets it really dry really quickly and yeah just kind of like if it's 35 and 35 percent it's like good and dry and nice and cold that's what i've been achieving like the temperatures at here um in that time of the season uh and it's you know ideal it makes the dry it dries the hash uh within like three to five days but then i'll let it sit for five to about seven six seven and then you know i'll card it once i'll like dis like flip it around just to check it and stuff in between time and uh yeah those you know that cold cold condition and dry it really helps i mean and that's what even yeah that's i think the key is 30 like you know if you can get it cold it's really hard to achieve that coldness you know without mother nature uh just kind of doing it so but i've seen some ice on the edge of the work bag as i'm washing which is pretty crazy damn <laughs> yeah that's cool man that is so sick the ring of the rim of the can like frozen pretty well <laughs> but yeah because you're saying like it gets annoying to work in the cold but i will say like i've had annoyingly like the cold shiver when i work in an ac cold room but when i'm like in mother nature i agree with that right it's like a different right. cold i don't know it's just yeah. maybe it just it's more natural obviously yeah i, I watch it, i watch like basically outside certain times of the year just because it's yeah. it's nice you know it's nice too right yeah like i'll yeah, probably exactly. process all my outdoor like that this year hell yeah that's cool i mean it's how, how funny it's supposed to be too like that after you harvest it is winter time. oh yeah you do yeah. it in winter time you know make hash so it's a great seasonal thing for me too like i love it for sure yeah i i think it's much more practical and like i i think it's very respectful thing go by the seasonal thing i, I that's one thing i really like about you guys is you know, you're oh, yeah. doing some really cool shit, like, when you're done with the fog, like, you're washing hash all winter, Brandon, and it's just like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and then you're farming all summer, and, like, that's, you're, you're doing the right thing to what yeah, it's 100%, supposed to be. dude. It's yeah, dude. really fucking badass, you know? Like, indoor can never beat that. And they never can. can. Yeah. It's meant to be like a hundred percent. You're meant to spend your days outside when it's that nice of a weather, you know. I'm yeah. What, what better way to do it than grow your food and cannabis for the year? I, you feel, know what I'm I, feel, I feel so loved. I love you guys. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, do this, just... I do this for the love of of showing like everyone that is possible so we all can do it together for sure. Seriously. I know it's hard, yeah, man. But I hold space for everyone and uh yeah, man, I really do. I just it's my it's it's in my blood i think it's the instinct and the human in me that is meant to do this shit for sure god you guys make me make me feel loved right now for real yeah, yeah. it's big dude yeah we like that's 
I'm glad you found your channel with life, man. I'm glad that we can all find passion in the cannabis plant, you know, and share our experiences with it with I others. I feel it, man. I feel it. People look up to us, you know, and we got to be good examples. And, and and I feel like we totally freaking are. So it's amazing. Yeah, it's even just, even uh, Shiragam touched on that earlier about just a lot of fluff in the in the world of cannabis, you know, in this community. And um, I think for me, I know misinformation is just like a big pet peeve of mine. I see a lot of people whether they do it intentionally for business or if it's unintentionally off of their experience, but just misinformation given to the patient is like, to me, that's like every, that's why I do this, man. Like for real, like I saw a very young age, my mom be seizure free from actually bubble hash capsules that I was just emulsifying into coconut oil. And um, honestly, ever since then, I just felt like that was like, the more I've been able to see people benefit from cannabis has made me realize that like, this is what I want to do. You know, it's like, Oh, yeah. it just is something that's just a beautiful thing to be a part of you know and that sense and just this it's such a growing thing whether you look at it on either side of it the legality side of it or just like what we're experiencing and understanding and how you said about hash man you know just it's changed so much in the years especially rising within the last few years and just the emulation of things and uh, what people are achieving you know and just it's a very cool thing to be a part of. I'll agree with you, man. Community is everything. So it's like, yeah. And I know like we share a lot of the same vibes and uh, you know, we all don't get to hang out every day, but it's, it's, it's in us as like, as people that we share that same vibe. And that's why I feel, you know, great to know that we all are teachers teaching the good teach. And, you know, it's a uh, for sure. Yeah, man. I feel it. I feel it. And what else? What other questions we got? We got that was <laughs> oh, that was that was all stemmed off of got uh, tons of environment. Questions. And I That's feel it. like we get we got pretty good <laughs> on environment. Let's talk um, about wicking. Let's talk about wicking. You want to talk yeah, about so basically that's what I was gonna get into is like you once you guys are done washing the material, you know, like I'll see people posting, for example, for the freeze dryer, when they're dumping that material into the freeze dryer, it looks really, really, really wet. And I mean, for them doing the freeze dryer, maybe that's good. And Brandon, again, you might have obviously more experience on that, but what are you guys doing with your water when it's coming out of the bags? Or like you said, Brandon, wiki. Um, uh, water, out of, water out of the bags, like out of the, like out of all the screens, like the extra water? No, like the water, water that's, that's in wicking. the resin when you're done okay. filling your bags, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so like I stack what we like what I do is stack like a good a couple hand towels and then the 25 micron screen that all bubble bag sets come with um that's the wicking screen if anyone wanted to know what it's for um that you know so I start stacking the the hash and like to say what you were saying before about like how wet it can go into the freeze dryer some people put it in really 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 wet um like a lot more water so it's really level and flat and it attends to dry it pretty quickly because the machine sucks moisture out at a really high level. So if that's the moisture, it will suck it out. Um, I've seen good things from that. And then I'm used to kind of maybe doing a little less moisture and maybe more hash. So you got to balance the really what's the ratio of how much hash you're putting on that tray is important. It's a little bit, a little bit more water. And, you know, if it's a lot, then a little bit less water and maybe more dry time, you know. So, but that's... Um, but that's kind of like what I feel like on that, um, on the on the waterway. But the wicking, you know, back to the wicking, it was like, uh, I kind of, when I scoop it out, I kind of make sure it has this like pancake consistency. This is like the, what I go back, like camp, uh, pancake batter is like this, okay. this I, I, the best way for me to explain it to someone when it looks like pancake batter, right? I, and then, so when I scoop it out like that, it's a little, it slides off my spoon a little bit nicer, right? When I'm like jiggling it and I put it on the wicking screen and I tend to stack it. I notice uh, Adam does this too, which I wish he was here. So he stacks as much as he can up high and not as much wide. It's all about surface area too. And if you go too wide, then it's just more on the screen and this and that. So I tend to go up and the moisture just runs right through it. And the, 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 the rags underneath, like literally suck it out. So um, that's kind of maybe that, and we can 
switch it, whatever else you guys think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've noticed with, with the wicking, like some strains like to be thinned out and then some strains really like to have that pressure on top of it, like you were saying, okay. you know, and it starts to really like that pressure on top of it starts to let it like evenly drain out, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I just lost my train of thought right there. <laughs> so, but you, Cam, you've told me in the past, uh, you don't do the towel like Brandon, you do the paper towels, right? I do paper towels. Yeah. So, um, I do paper towels and, um, and then use them to clean up. Um, but yeah, you just want to get as much paper towel that like, um, I just eyeball it of like, I use a certain like big of a screen and I eyeball how much paper towel I'm going to really need. And especially some strains that they, if they release moisture really quick and you need to have them extremely cold, almost like as if you're like trying to shock vegetables after you blanch them, you need to get them right away into like a cold environment and with a bunch of paper towel underneath it because they're going to release it right away. And that's the key moment you need, especially for the first two washes, um, for it to wick out properly so you can sieve it and it breaks apart for yourself, you know? Um, but yeah, you need to know like the time is m more than the amount of paper towel. Like eventually you eyeball how much paper towel you need. And a lot of times it's even a little bit more than you needed. But more than anything, you need to know those strains that you absolutely need a lot of paper towel for and you need to get it into cold right away. Yeah. So you out properly so you can handle it, you know? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think, I don't know, like, I've seen, like, I guess people ask me a lot if I wet sieve, and I feel like there's, like, a, obviously, there's so many levels to what moisture it's going to be at, depending on what you sieve. Um, there's strains that I know that if I allow it to sieve while I'm still continuing washing, that it becomes more annoying to work with, so I would rather sieve the washes kind of, not as I go, but through the process, kind of go back to sieve while washing. Yeah, And then there's others that don't matter as much, you know, like I've noticed sour diesels, like a lot of even Kim crosses that I've at least had or uh, much more on the sandier side, like how you were saying, how you, how you like to pull out Brandon, like around like that, uh, the pancake batter. Um, mm -hmm. And I stack mine as well. Like most of the stuff, I'll just stack layers of hash and allow it, it will just seep through pretty well. <clears throat> and then when I'm about to sieve, it feels like Basically, when you walk on this, like if you're on like the beach, you know, in the wet sand, that's like compacted at the. Oh. Did we lose them? Oh, shit. Uh-oh. You guys got me? Yeah. yeah we wet sand at the beach. Yeah, sorry. I'm not the best at Zoom. But yeah, yeah. Like the, just that clumpy consistency, you know, of like. It's definitely yeah. dependent on the strain, but a lot of them, that's what I try to go for. Slightly drier than just like straight clumpy, but definitely like on that drier, but still held to, held pretty well together until you want to try to work it through the sieve with whatever. Like I've some strains I like to use just straight gloves even, and just like they have that finer feel that it's really easy to just like rub through the sieve and uh, yeah. just work the rest of it through with a spoon or something, you know? And then others, it seems like you want to do the spoon the whole time because even no matter how thick your gloves are and how cold your room is, your body temperature is still going to heat up the hash to make it have more of a trouble to work its way through the screen, you know? So, um, yeah. totally. obviously, cultivar yeah. being the biggest part of that. Right, and I, I think I should have said that, too. It's like, yeah, when I feel like what I was saying, too, is like really what I do with the sandier heads that's kind of how I act with the sandy heads. Yeah. And then like when Camden said like thinner on the stickier stuff, you know, is that what you mean too? Like when you put the ones thinner, um, bro, when um, you spread them out a little bit thinner, you said on the drying screen, it's like, it tend to be the sticky, the stickier ones. Yeah, absolutely. Those are yeah. I try to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. To warn everyone like why too, it's cause it's so much easier when it's thinner it can break apart and get through that that sieve a lot quicker. When you try to yeah. make it a chunk, it'll just oh, roll. Oh yeah, it'll roll. Oh yeah, you're just sieve. making you're just making yeah. cannolis at that point. Yeah, <laughs> yo. And then that's like, when have fun get smoking wet hash. 
Yeah, your oh, yeah. seeds yeah. caked, everything's caked, and you're just like, what is going on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, I feel yeah, like in the last few years, I've been able to cut my drying, like, or like my hands on time of separation, separating hash in half again, even though I've been doing it for even more years than that. Towards the beginning, it was just like hours, even like with wash times. I've cut my wash times down with the same right. amount of agitation or like ability to, to free a trichome head. And like, that's what I try to tell people when they start washing, you're going to, if you get lucky and you wash hash strains at first, it's still going to be like a lot of failure and just like stress you know like yeah and then totally. there's gonna be those like times that you you can wash the most fire material grown ethically or however you are you're gonna agree with it and like also just like proper ha like proper flour but not proper hash material and wash it and just be so let right. down that some people are gonna go straight to trying to make you know any type of uh like any anything else with their with their material whatever you know yeah. it's like they're yeah. not gonna try to water make water hash again you know yeah so. no totally totally yeah that's why you know the wicking part for hand drying is like the first step coming out of that bag and it's so important and so you know knowing what type of resin i think you have is like knowing the first step on top of that too is like whether or not should it be spread thin or stacked and you know whether it's going to react like that sour d and i like how you use sour d because everyone knows sour d and it's it, it kind of feels like more of a wet sand yeah and that wet sand i think is a great beginner strain or like a you know a beginner strain to work with so you know yeah, yeah look for sour d grow sour d if you're out there you know listening so it's it makes the job a lot easier and then you start there and you learn so much more from that step and without losing as much at least Yes. I mean, I've even had GMO like that, which is crazy, like that same consistency. And then I've oh, had yeah. a few rounds yeah. where it's not like that, though. And I'm not sure why. Oh. The room didn't get hotter. Uh, that's what I thought at first. I'm like, maybe the room got hotter and all the the heads just formed some more like the, the cuticle started to rupture. So it had more of an oily consistency. I never figured it out. It was just much more annoying to have to see and separate than other rounds, you know. And uh, I mean, I'm pretty kind of just like feed the energy off the plant. So. I know I did different things when I grew the plant, you know, but like not enough like that I could, or not anything that I could directly pinpoint and be like, and that's why logistics are huge. I feel like I do it more with hash than I do with growing plants. And it's something I need to focus on more because I'll break it. I usually grow everything and I'll take resin like per square foot numbers and yield percentage fresh rose. And I don't think a lot of hash makers only look at a fresh rose number and you could be watching plat washing something like platinum girl scout cookies that doesn't yield much starting material but it's going to put out a lot of hash for that number that you're looking at at the end and uh that's that's not really as important to at least to the farmer like you know at the end of the day and really what you can kind of try to achieve so well and do you think much of that has to do with like maybe having a smaller space like you just gotta be able to not have to but you want to be able to produce more in the space that you have so if something produces a decent yield and a decent return on that yield then that makes it viable well like yeah that's part of it like a good example is barbara bud like um that's probably the most medicinal plant like that i wash like that has multiple ailments i've seen it help people with tourette syndrome like anxiety tons and tons of people that'll tell me the exact same thing that drive a lot that it helps their knee pain like back pain scoliosis a bunch of stuff but like that plant it yields i'd say like if i'm thinking of numbers after squishing my rosin pools for rosin and keeping full melt it yields usually around like lower threes to like about i mean i've hit four percent after rosin which is honestly really good to me but it throws chunky grenades like it's a good growing it doesn't it's more of a patient plant very easy to grow very minimal feed you could do anything you want with it but it is like slow veg it doesn't want to stretch and flower it just straight goes wide like it'll just swallow your canopy but it's a very easy plant to grow and it still yields you with a bountiful harvest and when you wash it obviously the the it still puts out good numbers if you're getting a better yield so like strains that just don't you have to think about like from the farmer standpoint if they're at least single sourcing it they think about that more about how much resin they're getting off of even a table or however they grow and count their resin their square footage they're thinking about like what is the best to put in here for you have to you have to take it all into there's plenty of stuff if it's going to help somebody especially somebody i personally know i'm going to grow it you know it's that's not 
I see you over there, Brandon, running a bunch of OGKB, you know, for whatever. I'm sure that that smoke is powerful. I have another buddy that runs that, like, nobody's business, wants to send me a cut for that reason, and I haven't ran it. And, like, yeah, I was going to say. Seems to love like, you, though. Seems like it grows well for you, especially under the sun. Dude, I know. I've gotten people. People get upset when I bring up the plants sometimes <laughs> because of how much you fuck with people. And I'm like, yo, it's amazing here. The shit grows, like whenever i mean it grows enough for me to be like yo it's raging you know and <laughs> and uh yeah it loves our soil that we created so it's really potent that's what i've noticed it's a really heavy feeder from that cookie fam era that they were doing you know the hunson shit um they were heavily feeding some shit so i know it got kept and their lines are something that it's hard to achieve like on an outdoor level and like organically or something you know but it, it just takes that fertility you know years to build and now it loves it and a higher ph i noticed it likes a higher ph and then oh just, damn all right and yeah you know and it just rages in the sense of um so like it just knocks anyone on their ass and it's like a really <laughs> medicinal plant yeah it's great such- for menstrual cycles and like you know depression or anxiety too like it yeah. just sets you it sets you straight it's really like almost um the fuck it button you know, there's that commercial with yeah. the red button, and yeah, 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 yeah. I kind of take oh, yeah. a dab of that, and I just that's it. Sometimes I just want to say fuck it and just relax, and that's the one, you know. So I got to keep it. Around. I remember it's like, Kirk is, yeah, Kirk that's got something from that one. You know? like, <laughs> I love that shit. Yeah, I have a buddy that smokes uh, a lot of Platinum Girl Scout cookies, and he broke his back, and he's like same way about that strain, and it it really is just like that same type of exactly what you said you know just on that scale of it i've that's why i always enjoyed that one more than forum i like the flavor the smell of forum girl scout more i guess out of all the girl scout stuff like that but yeah Platinum that's pretty that sweeter one. i like that, that hitter you know it is and and no one really grows it anymore so to me it's a rarity and obviously it veggies come really slow you know from no matter what and um so the yields are really you have to run it and it's really hard to clone it's why it's been never really ran like this but the last season we had great success cloning it so um just you know utilizing what we, we what we get you know and yeah i'm just stoked to start bringing it to the market and everyone's gonna be like brah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i tried your i know that one i'm gonna get a thousand like 2017 i think was that run that you did of that OGKB. Yeah, that last one. And like harvested on my, like right after my birthday. It was amazing, man. And it was just like. But it was yeah. strong, like you said. It's medicinal, man. Yeah. It's a power plant. Yeah. And it's drought resistant. So another reason why I love it. Uh, we live in a freaking desert practically. And that thing doesn't require much attention. Doesn't need trellis at all because it's so hardy. It's, yeah. like, a, it's like a cactus. It's like strong as shit. <laughs> So, yeah, it, it doesn't drink at all. It, it's yeah. it's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, but that one's a fairly greasy one. So if you want to think about that one on a hand dry level, that's the one that to me I have to be quick on my toes because it'll yeah. want to just stuck. It wants to stick to everything. And then if that actually that brings me into another thing, which will be great for us to talk about right now. Um, yeah. So after the wicking stage, and you want to start sieving it. The yeah. sieving process. Now, I feel like your temperature of the hash is very important, and Absolutely. the moisture and the moisture level of the hash. You know, yeah. And, and and those two things combined are different for every strain, and yep. very very hard to achieve perfect numbers on. And each number is different. So, like to think, I don't know exactly what numbers. Camden, you probably know because you shot maybe a temp gun on that um no so we we have just like an old school thermometer inside the fridge that i use okay um it gets down to like you know like maybe 20 because it's it's a mini fridge that i i crank up and down depending on a strain because certain sandy strains i crank down because sandy strains need a longer time to release their moisture um it seems like they're more absorbent of the moisture and we release it slower and then like the other strains that i have more hard time with I have to crank it up because it seems like they need to get down almost to like 25 to like somewhat not freeze, but like be cold enough to where they let their moisture out without sealing itself. You know what I mean by that? 
mm-hmm. about when that mm-hmm. pile starts to seal. Like you have to get it <laughs> right into the fridge and the yeah. fridge could be already very, very cold. So you can like shock that blanched vegetable, you know, even yes. though I don't experience yeah. like such a small like temperature fluctuation there. Exactly. So, it's so yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah, it needs to be like shocked again, cold, to allow moisture to do its own thing. And then And I th- and I say it also helps it like break up when it's that shocked of cold. It yeah. gets it helps 100%. it break up because yeah. if you want to go at it with that spoon and it wants to give and like not want to kind of break you're going to immediately stop yourself and be like all right it needs to be colder <laughs> yeah you know yeah, and it's like, that crack like yeah. the natural and almost but too cold but then too cold right. i've seen i've seen the <laughs> terrible problem of that where i've been like oh fuck i have to now microplane this because then no matter yeah. what it wants to come back and moisture clings to this like thousand percent yeah, yeah. yeah so you're that's it's where I saved myself window. so much time one time was when I found that out that I was like, I, cause I agree with you a hundred percent Camden about that. Like, especially the word, the seal, like, Oh man, like when I, that's like the best way to explain it. You know, like there's right. been times that I over, like whether it was over wicked it or it just like somehow it sealed. Like that's like, I remember, I don't know who it was, but somebody said that's like the rupture of the trichome head and it like kind of just sealing itself. Like I remember just being like, well, either gonna microplane this or i've got wet hash type deal you know like uh, so i don't know how long it was but i had that obviously happen to me too and i you mm -hmm. know figured it's just like such a greasy strain and melting on itself at room or temp is like what it's you know exposed to on the top half and it like glazed itself like a donut you know like it did that so and i flipped it over i flipped it over and did exactly the same i kind of broke it from the bottom the bottom oh. wasn't exposed the bottom was still cold and had a little bit of moisture so the bottom actually it cracked. opened up it cracked yeah. and then oh. i cracked it from the inside of that half uh-huh. out like literally broke it broke it broke it outwards again and again <laughs> and again but that was the only way to save my ass on that and it's still right. you know and it still gets maybe some big chunks at the end when i'm pushing it through and that i couldn't see and i'll mm-hmm. just push those to the side and let those take in an extra week to dry or what you know that's what i do and then um yeah that's like it's a risky that's a last minute like oh shit i gotta catch it before like <laughs> you, know, you could burn it's like burning the cake or something i don't know which way you want to put it but it yeah. can, you can ruin the whole thing right there for sure right yeah no ab- absolutely yeah that seal on, on it like totally makes it but figuring out how to make that seal the smallest possibility is is the it's the thing of fucking with to know that. your strain to know your strain to grow that strain <laughs> yeah. you know to maybe make smaller oh, yeah. fresh frozen bags off the bat and try try it out like test runs like three test runs don't say you're going to get it the first try you know like and to really instead of just throwing all your marbles or all your eggs in one basket or whatever um you know that's what i would tell everyone to do too so i feel it yeah man. Yeah. Yeah, so kind of connecting a couple points, right? So the the wicking process that we talked about is so important because however that hash ends up from that process is going to affect how you're able to sieve it or in another case, microplane it, which we don't have Adam here to kind of elaborate on that. But Camden, you brought up earlier at the beginning when I asked, is there a wrong way to do this? Uh, or a wrong way to air dry and you said well one of the things is you could be properly uh, improperly sieving and that would likely come from improperly wicking correct yes absolutely yeah you, you would be sieving it way too early yeah so when have you guys have it, had experience sieving material that's been too wet like along your learning process and <laughs> that kind of you know, oh hell yeah! Dude. yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. that laugh. That was great. He's just like you just instantly flash back real quick to the days of failures of making hash. Like, yeah. oh I, I man. Think even even back in the day when I used to make really super improper sieved hash. Um, this like even before I got an Instagram is like it the shit would look like you know old school hash but like in dots. 
You know what I mean by that? Where it would have that like old school, like almost oxidized around it, but just all in the, it's like dipping dots, old school hash, almost looking. And, um, and that's, I mean, I love that stuff at, at that moment, you know, cause that's what I knew and it was awesome. But, um, yeah, it, it, like for a very long time, I, I thought that it was okay to like have a pretty moist ass, like amount of resin on a parchment paper, like in a, like closet and drying, you know, but, um, as time went on and found out about, about like how, like even a real small piece, like with that, like little sheen of moisture inside of it, not good but i don't know this is not like really off topic but does anybody remember this guy that used to dry hash by separating it with a toothpick like he would literally sit there and take his wicked hash and separate it with a toothpick it was like something an icy mag that he said he got it from or something really wild though but like Whoa. he used to post macro shots like back on uh like forever ago and um it was just like inspiring to me i'm like man that's like that's like full on love like love for the labor of it all you know what i'm saying like just like yeah. just fully embodied it you know i can see that and i was i thought about though i'm like man like if you're if you catch it at that right time like we're talking about and you're just breaking yeah. it down brittling it mm. off with like a little almost like a chisel real carefully you probably would have like the most separated hash that's as close to like sift you know like or something where you have more trichome heads fully for sure. Shape, I but. yeah, I remember old dudes like just chopping it with a ID card, like right. the, <laughs> like that was yeah. like oh yeah, a pr big time, a rough, rough, rough thing of like the time, and it was <laughs> probably smashing it down at that one point too. You know, when you're kind of like pushing it and sealing some, and you know, smashing some, which would get tighter. That's yeah, yeah. I would actually see with the toothpick, as long as you got the time, shit, like that might yeah, you could be poking you know it all separate and then take your you know bigger chunks and let smaller them down and then it looked like a sieved it looked like it probably was sieved i, I could i could see that yeah his stuff looks sieved his stuff looks yeah. fully sieved it's crazy yeah. definitely true yeah i mean the sieve is just another tool to speed up the process really you know yeah, um, I think before they yeah. were just like you said brandon they were chopping i mean even in the bubble man videos that i used to watch a long time ago like yeah chopped it up with you know just some kind of like credit card almost type thing and he was putting it on cardboard right and then yep. everybody else started using parchment over time and you know that's one of the things that i wonder is do you guys believe i mean i think i know the answer based on our conversation but do you guys believe that resin can be a hundred percent dry i mean you know to the extent it can be by doing it through this process the yeah. process of i think 100 percent. i yeah i don't know that uh i want to say it's medicine farms medicine farms do people know him i'm not sure i think he's like somewhere in washington um, or something but he he used to test all his stuff for moisture levels for like his moisture level so um i don't know i've seen moisture levels yeah. lower for for hash than flour from air dried hash and freeze dried hash yeah you know and but when i talked to flynn from wook sauce he's uh, i think basically does freeze dryer all the time now but he still talked about how he felt like you needed to have a little bit of moisture in your resin like it's not supposed to be bone dry what would you guys say to that yeah, um, I mean, yeah. I'd, I'd say yeah. I don't know. Go ahead, for sure. I don't. I can't really touch on it much, anyways. But yeah, I I've definitely had a room where where like I dehued pretty hard and left it for like a day over to where like I was pretty familiar to the strain and its resin and the way it's dried, and it was actually a really easy strain to dry and was like, yeah, very easy going like batch every single time with the strain and um. But this one time, this dehu, like I was running it like a way too big of dehu, and I wasn't as careful as usual because I wasn't used to it. And I would say that this batch got dried out way too much, and it didn't have the same like juicy appeal uh, in the smoke. I'm saying, um, as well as the look, but more than anything, in the smoke, it didn't have that like really full coat feel to it. 
and then it seemed a little bit more like a hollow circle of like a, of a smoke texture yeah. if you know what i mean yeah totally i agree with that um was, yeah that, yeah definitely i feel like well and then how much percentage of like some terpenes play a moisture level into that because they're oils it's like a mo you know like they're always off gassing and i know my straw guava mm -hmm. is like it just is gas like i mean they're just so loud you know it's always off gassing and it's always quick right. to butter and always all that and it's like that right there i feel like yeah if i over dried that and had that like loss of flavor it's sucking the oils and the terps out so it's like how many terps should we leave in to know like how moist the hash is still too because yeah like i want some gooey flavorful hash mm -hmm. but you know like when there's the point where the moisture's out and now we're taking out terps like where's that line you know and it's really hard to say, but yeah, I think, you know, we all agree yeah, that we want some, we want that body. And I feel like yeah. the body comes, you know, from the moisture, like gives some flavor that yeah, coats our palate. That's like the right. best way to put it. And yeah, you say it's like smoking, like, like, and it's missing, like, it's like, uh, you're just getting more air, like flavor and like a little bit of like, you know, um, yeah. yeah. Kind of um, sort of thing. There. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And so, you know, you guys have brought up obviously things here and there. Uh, Macho, I know you were talking about the bar bud, which I think that's from the Great Gardener, isn't it? Like originally, you run yep. that and you run a few other things. So let's talk about a little bit about genetics. I know if we, Brandon could keep us here all day with as many genetics as they run over there. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yo. Can I take a bathroom break real quick? Go for it, bro. Let me right. uh, let me let me pause this. <coughs> All right, we're cool. We're back from a bathroom slash smoke break. So we were talking about genetics, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. We have to dig into genetics. Yeah. Uh, what kind of genetics are you guys running, or you know, maybe things that are like memorable to you since you've talked a lot about how getting to know a particular resin helps you work with it better. <laughs> we'll go uh, with everybody said. Everyone. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm so excited to hear other people talk. I'd much rather listen first than go. I'm like. Um. I think uh, what one of the things for me is sour amnesia because I've gotten to do my dogs in a way, man. All right, um, is sour amnesia because I got to wash the different females <coughs> I've washed, and then also smoke a lot of the flower that do not wash, and for over like a handful of years that I, I got to wash these things and. Um, it's pretty interesting because different characters of those seeds will absolutely not wash. And you can tell that from the smoke and the smell. And other, like, three different characters will wash. And wash pretty good, but in different ways. Uh, two in, in the same way and one in a different way. Uh, one being the sativa one that was expressing much more of a metallic haze. Um, and it had a much more slower release of moisture than the other ones that had a representation of more of a hybrid of a sour diesel and amnesia. Um, and where it had a little bit more oil to it and was, had, was a more like clear separation with um, its green material stayed together very nicely and it separated very nicely. Um, but like washing it over and over again, like you get different experiences from it. Like when if somebody had to like cut it like a couple of days early, or if somebody you know like fed salts, or with like single-ended lights compared to double-ended lights to LEDs, um, it all kind of produced a different thing. But you kind of get used to it and know the strain all within itself, and. I feel it's a huge, big piece of info about a strain is if you get to really experience the genetic pool of it and, and like, make a match with it and, like, know, you know, these plants don't 
belong with processing this way. Like you should just smoke these, you know? Um, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So <clears throat> you were saying like that one that was more hazy or of this kind of metallic smell. Yes. You said that one washed differently. But you didn't really go into how that one washed differently. What was it that stood out about that one? Um, so that one had a much longer wicking time. Um, and it had a much larger 70 micron yield compared to the 120 where the uh, other two phenocystera and niche I'm familiar with um, have a larger 120 yield or more like almost equal to the 70. Um, but the haze one is a little bit smaller um, and it holds on to moisture quite a bit. Um, and maybe that's due to the micron size of the majority of the heads that are full melt that I'm concentrating on that doesn't allow the moisture to settle down as quick as larger heads where the water can flow through a, a larger grain, that is. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and Michael, since we were just talking about it kind of off air, I guess you could say the Death Coast, can you talk a little bit about working with that plant uh, as a hash plant and, and the drying process? Um, it's, uh, I think we were kind of speaking on those styles of plants earlier. You guys can hear me good, right? Cause my phone died. So I had to like connect up. Am I good? Yeah. yeah. You're all, good. all right, cool. Um, yeah. Um, kind of like that drier, uh, also Camden touched on it. That just like, it's definitely one of those quicker plants to dry. I've honestly never been able to dry a plant as quick and over dry a plant. Um, like kind of how that is. Uh, it's one of those styles of structures of plants. It's a fun one to work with. I just like the flavor of stuff like that. I'm really into like gassy, Kimmy, uh, sour, sour diesel. Oh man, I like grew up smoking like every, it was like nice to be able to get good East Coast sour diesel. It was just like that smell like honestly, like diesel gas sometimes and tennis ball terps, like just like, yeah, just really enjoyable for me. And the effect of all those has been very enjoyable. So, um, like I'm kind of, I'm not really like I'm into, I'm kind of like, kind of like, it's real weird, like citrus strains, you know, how they'll kind of get you going and stuff. They're definitely more like cerebral and in the head and stuff like that. A lot of those uh, will tend to give me anxiety because I'm already kind of, I guess, just going like that. I don't really smoke cash for that. And I feel like sour diesel was like one of those ones that was something more of that headband effect, like how hand, headband will do that to you, like give you that pressure on your, on your temples and stuff and just like definitely be more set in like that that's kind of what i've enjoyed about it um but also it's just a even like gmo it's just another one like that that just growing under lamps uh I, there's a lot of people that talk about the 90 bag and stuff like that and like a lot of strains definitely i feel like cultivar to cultivar you're gonna see 90 micron be consistently good um but there's strains that i pull way better 120 than i do and fatter pools of 120 than yeah. I do of 90 for sure and the hash like the best hash I've ever smoked is probably 160 micron um yeah the death coast is pulled for me this last round even under lamps the last couple of rounds same with GMO one round I pulled 219 to 160 that was just like so melty as hash the effect from it was just insane like um mm. and so like I don't know it's just like I'm in this like those and it they tend to be juicier and uh just have more of that like how we were talking about juiciness i feel like they hold that yeah. a little more when they're those larger heads um mm -hmm. so yeah some i wanted to hear brandon talk on maybe even if not during this about hash cultivars but just about like sun-grown resin and how much that he might see if he's ever grown lamp grown or have friends that grow the same selections lamp grown and just how trichome heads kind of relate on as far as like size trichome heads and what you're <clears throat> what you're able to achieve I, I guess outside it seems like in my experience very little experience at least with sun grown and just what I would assume from how that how it is I would assume that you're able to pull a more ripe trichome head that's larger outside and just grows to its full potential maybe not, not ripeness isn't definitely not the best word like just and definitely not maturity but just like peak 
size of like what it's able to achieve under the sun. Yeah, um, definitely. I think like that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like that's, you know, it's not just sun grown too. You know, it is. All right, it is. But I have a tremendous amount of sun on the property here, um, which is. You know, if you've been here before, you know it. It's um, there's almost 14 hours of direct sunlight in the summer. Um, there's no trees. You know, I've seen really far into the valley of the sunset and stuff. So um, I think that's also another indicator. Like this plant can handle full sun when it's grown properly. And shadow, like shade grown cannabis, is definitely different. Um, you know, stuff I've grown the same strain yet over in the bush. Um, then, or, you know, in the full sun and the resin's completely different. Um, and, but yeah, for sure. I haven't grown too many indoors. I only done like a couple runs ever from beginning to end indoor. Um, three of them. And I'd say two of them were only good. And, uh, but hash two of them for sure. And it was really good. I don't think I did the same strain. Um, just the one strand, just strawberry guava. And the hash was really good. Um, both, you know, both times it's really, the size micron is where it differs. And I feel like it's because of the light being stationary and holding its place above the plant and not moving. I mean, I don't have lights that do that slow thing. I don't really think many people do. Um, and I think, you know, that's where we get a certain area and then yeah it's usually 90 micron <clears throat> that is the peak um that is the money bag but usually the bigger heads are bigger and sweeter and yeah more ripe and more flavorful just like how a bigger fruit would be on the tree um that got more sun um so i think that's where i you know as fruit trees here on my farm and seeing things develop side by side with cannabis like yeah the bigger tastier fruits are more exposed to the sun so it, same thing, you know, I think that's side by side comparison. Yeah, the sun is an influence on making things bigger and more what their fullest potential could be and more flavorful as their full potential yeah. could be. Um, yeah, you know, totally. And that's, yeah, you know, because a little like, sidetrack and, yeah, I'm on all the stuff about strains. Uh, and stuff, but. Yeah. And, and, you know, every strain is different, of course, but like, I think it's just... Like I said, it goes back to the sun and the sunrise and sunset is so drastic here that it literally hits the side of the plant, you know, at the end of the day and the beginning of the day. That's how it doesn't come up. Like I, I, I get sun from end to end. So I think that's when I'm out there taking nug shots in the morning, I, you probably remember seeing them like some of this shit glows because the sun hits it directly <laughs> sideways. It's, 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 a, yeah. it's, it's crazy. It's remarkable that you know the, the the full full 360 on it or 180 excuse me <laughs> oh yeah yeah and just like i guess how much the different sun too is in the morning sun it's you know hitting the plant when it's coming off a cold night um huge like terps are different smelling at that hour and then there's the midday really? um and then there's the evening and the midday is definitely the worst because of the heat of the day um, and the evening comes in and, and tends to be really nice because the coolness, uh, that drops down into the valley here. Um, so I think that also plays a huge part into when you're harvesting your plant and stuff too. And I, you're really indoors, it's kind of lights on or lights off, but here there's, uh, you know, oh, yeah. even planting it with the moon. And you were saying too, Mike, we want to talk about on how, you know, some stuff is grown and the love that's put into it there's a huge cosmic connection that we believe here that this plant and humans share. And when things align just right in the cosmos and with, with, with everything in the stars that we believe, it, it enhances the medicine tenfold. And we achieve, you know, we try to achieve that the best we can, you know, across the board. We're, you know, two of us, mostly me and Amanda do it all. And we get very tired, of course, but we, we believe into nightly harvesting and uh, underneath the moonlight and doing these types of things that I think in, in, enhance the resin too, because they farmers almanac goes into it deep too, and when to harvest certain fruits and vegetables 
um, and the timing and, and with all that too. So it, it's, it's just deep, you know, when you start looking at it in this realm of, you know, plants and the planet and stuff. But yeah, that's the love. I mean, the love that goes into it is really tremendous. And I feel like that speaks something of the hash too that we all need to, you know, embrace. Oh, yeah. too. But we can go back yeah, to yeah. genetics. I don't think I said which genetics. I was going to say OGKB was mine <laughs> for sure. Just <laughs> yeah, answer that one too. <laughs> No, no, you're good. And I mean, yeah, Michael, you, you did bring up earlier, you, you wanted to bring up that kind of point. And since we're on it, I mean, um, I'm not sure what you wanted to say, but feel free. Oh, uh, what point exactly? I can't remember. I'm sorry. Were you no, talking about you're something? In regards to like uh, the love that has to go into. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got yeah. you. Sorry. Yeah, you're talking about, we were talking about that on break or something. I forgot about that. I thought yeah. it was already kind of recorded. But uh, But yeah, definitely like just like the connection that you could have with a farmer and just feeling really like they're either the, you feel the love that they put into the plan or just that they care about what they're doing, you know, into the sense that you can really see it translate into what you're obviously eating. Like even back to the point of just having like properly, properly picked fruit, you know, like that's huge. Like mm -hmm. trying to figure out when to harvest something. A lot of people are just going to look at, a, at the ripeness of the, of the fruit and say, Hey, like the, the, time of the day or like if it's rained and all these other factors aren't really going to play into when they're going to harvest something i think that's alone in itself speaks about how how much love can go into something and just dedication i guess somebody has into something and i think that's just like people definitely have that connection to whatever the the connection is to the person that they are able to acquire medication like their meds from or whatever even if i just feel like all like cash use or any cannabis use in general is to me medicinal, whether it's just for your well being or like for an actual true ailment, you know? So, um, but yeah, the connection that you have with your food is very similar. If you, if you're able to go to the farmer's market and find somebody that has quality food, right. I feel like that translates a lot into the, the work people are putting into the cannabis plant, you know, heavily just beyond even the farming aspect, you know, just connecting with people and being able to, like share their experience with what they learn from somebody with somebody else. It's like being able to just connect the dots and kind of put things together with certain people that might be able to learn something or not even just learn, just experience something from you that makes them go to find something that might help them better in their whole journey with this plant, you know? So. Yeah, no, it's true, man. I think uh, love is definitely something that's real important and education. Uh, kind of like you were saying in a way, you know, um, but yeah, so sorry, we got kind of sidetracked, but it was good. I, I thought, you know, I thought it was a good, good point to bring up. So I appreciate you bringing that up and, and you, Brandon and Michael kind of elaborating on that, um, you know, kind of mixing in genetics to drying, right? So you guys talked about some genetics that you've worked with that kind of has stood out to you and, and for different reasons. So, you know, when you go from wicking to sieving, what is that like perfect look or texture that you're looking for in the resin? Is it almost like a powder that it's just like coming off the sieve easily? And then outside of that, what size or what kind of screens uh, or what size are your C's, I guess, is what I'm trying to say outside of that. Oh. No, exactly what size. The kitchen. I got it from, like, that really good <laughs> kitchen store. Um, so it's a good <laughs> a steal. You know, I like to give it a good bang on the side, you know, when I'm done. So I try to get a really good stainless steel. No plastic. I remember something back in the day we used plastic. And I'm like, well, what was this little plastic black bit? Oh, it's like <laughs> off the side of the C's. Um, but the sieve grain, like I would say, like could, it wouldn't fit a grain of rice through it. That's for sure. Um, is, I don't know. Does anyone know the size? No. But you I know like where Camden knows a stuff. little more. But I know I've asked him, and he sent me a link to like a uh, style of sieve he was using. So I know I've ordered them before. Similar. Oh, I use cool. different sizes sometimes. Even like I'll start 
it's yeah, been depending yeah. on the strain, but I'll start definitely with larger ones and then finish some strains with a finer strain. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know, I've definitely been able to achieve like more of the caviar look with like a, I just always call it like a single pass sieve hash, like just one time when I first kind of right. catch it at the weakness and then like yeah. more of a finer hash where people have thought it, it just definitely looks more microplaned as opposed to right. most sieve hash if you work it through finer sieves afterwards. But uh, yeah. And one of you, I mean, I'm sure you know, Brandon, about just like sieve or like if you're running your stuff freeze dried and through a sieve, like I know I've done it in the past and it looks still way finer because of how it falls through the sieve, even if the right. sieve's not as fine. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I was going to say I have a smaller sieve just for that in case, you know, any chunks or whatever I can find. Um, oh, and yeah. that too. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, it's just sometimes, like, I've definitely, not many times, but I've opened up the freeze dryer when I was learning, and I caught that, like, tail end of that little frozen chunk still. So, I'm like, I, ever since then, I was like, oh, I'll just save everyone. And it actually helps to, I think, like I said, just, like, level it out more to dry it, like, that last little final bit before I jar it back up. And um, I think that's, you know, some strains, though, I can't see through. So, like, OGKB out the freeze dryer. It's right. still like a son of a bitch, um, <laughs> yeah. you know. And I'm like, at that point, I'm like, no, nope, I won't even bother. We're gonna, <laughs> like, no one complains about that one anyway. And it, yeah, right. so. dude, that that, that resin so hard. Even dry trim of OGKB is so sticky, bro. Oh, yeah, I've never, never worked with it. I bet it's really like a different. You know, it really cakes the bag. Um, so you got to wash it at like the coldest temperature that you can physically handle. You know, when I see an yeah. ice on the end of the bag, when I know those days are coming, you know, I'm going to pull that. That's when you wash OGKB. Yeah. yeah. We all talk and I, like, I, I'll make <clears throat> huge plans on it because that's what has to happen. Um, I, so that's me yeah, training that's... myself, you know, to work with that, that girl as, as, as many years as I have. Um, yeah, that, yeah, definitely mm. something. But the sieve strain size, I was, yeah, I just kind of use, um, just like, yeah, a two different like, sieves. I got one's like more of a generic size, like the caviar size one. That's like, I don't know, you could see the square, but then the other one, and it's like a single wire. I know some of them have double wires. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, like the double wire. It's like, the what? Like there's, there's weaved ones and then there's like yeah, tough ones. Yeah. Yeah, the weaved ones. Them. That's the double wire ones, I think. Because yeah, I remember, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Like when I tried to order them online the first time, I fucked up because I just like I was like looking at them online and the pictures of them are just way worse. And I was just used used to order or like grabbing them in person at a kitchen store or something, you know. So. Right. Totally. So you also, Camden, do not like the double. It's just a single. Yeah, I like the single because um, there's like different like single weaved ones that like will be a larger hole where it's more of the caviar it's like you're embarrassing, you know two sizes once the caviar one and then once the finer one and like at some point when as resin is drying after the first sieve and you get to the second sieve even though before you were even drying that hash pile like it that's hash would stick to your spoon you're using yeah, but yet yeah. on the second sieve this stuff is breaking apart for you and then i feel like that's the important parts of what we're talking about about like time management of being there when it's needed it for and um and doing it at the correct time and temp and and making sure it breaks down itself instead of you know us being pissed that it's stuck in our sieve and then do you guys, I thought I heard one of you or maybe two of you talk about receiving it. Are you, are you doing the process again at some point and why? Uh, just to get it more of a consistent seed of the exact same like look to it, you know, and uh, you can definitely get it finer, especially if you run it through a finer seed, but even through the exact same seed, you can get it sometimes finer. It's just uh Making it more uniform, I guess the uniform uniformness, I guess of the hash, whatever word makes most sense. And so, are you doing that like one right after the other, or you're waiting for the material to dry a bit and then you? Yeah, I wait till it's fully dry. Usually, when I receive, and I'll basically sieve just all of it directly onto a piece of parchment and then jar all of it up directly after that. Most mm -hmm. of the time, it's how I have done it if I receive. But um, 
I'm sure you could do it. There's probably people that definitely do it during the dry process for other reasons or just to get it at that point quicker or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I do two stages while it's drying is what happens while it's drying after the wicking happens. I sieve once with my caviar sieve and I lay it down on the sheet and then it'll come time to after my next batch is ready to sieve right before I start sieving that, if it permits me to, I'll receive the one, the batch behind that one that I'm doing currently. And what will happen is it kind of forms this like first crisp. And then once that first crisp happens, you can gather it back up and then receive it. And it goes through really, really easy. And usually you will not have trouble with it unless it's a really, really difficult strain. Um, that you cannot receive unless you have to go a little bit earlier than that. But um, when this first crisp happens is when I know that like moisture has left the hash I already wet. It's getting pretty dry at this moment. And at this moment, it starts to become a little crystally because it's quite cold in, inside the room. And as it's getting crystally and gets this first crisp, going through this, uh, the second finer sieve, it will break apart into a much finer powder and, um, and it will dry much more evenly. You won't get um, different colors that are on the sheet pan. It will be more of the same color because it, it's more just like the surface area is, is more even because of it. And, um, and then after it's fully dried, if you want to break it down even more, like Brandon said earlier, carding it with a, just a blank card um you can order them on amazon and you simply have it really cold on your sheet pan because your sheet pan's probably already like maybe 40 degrees or something like that wherever you set your room to when you leave it and you can start carding it and it breaks itself and you can even put it through your first sieve and it'll start breaking itself because the rough edges around a sieve hash will break itself when it touches another like uh like part of the sieve and it'll just start breaking and breaking and breaking if you really spent time it can turn into really fine powder but you would have to have a cold room in the time mm -hmm. i agree with that for sure yeah you want it to like take from that small size and get it smaller and smaller yeah it'll dry more evenly and more quicker and it's that's like the hard part to achieve yeah with like the wrong strain you could definitely like mess that up um ogkb yeah just like that's the only one that i have that does is that difficult i try to kind of stay away from the more difficult ones just because it's you know it's that problem but um mm. but yeah you know definitely like some of the i think another another good strain to try to play around with if you don't know strains is strawberry banana for a fruity one that one's really a, a sandy like good head that can um pass through the sieve like that second time really easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I feel like OGKB, I've never successfully got it to get during the drying process to receive correctly. Like I can't get it. It's like, you just have to like sieve it. So like perfectly like the first sieve and then let it do its thing. It's, and it's the it's most, like, it's like the strain that just wants to react like the sappiest rosin in my <laughs> Oh like, man, it's the yeah. worst. It's the worst, but it tastes <laughs> so good and it feels so good. That's the one that I'll go through the ringer yeah. for. You yeah. got to sometimes, man. Dude, and, it's yeah, so good. It, and it's worth it every way. Like, you know, if you don't feel like it's like, I don't know, I feel like when you don't think it's dry enough, it's almost because that strain just wants to react so like soupy. Like it just once you bring it out of the freezer, like it's just instantly greasing within the hour. So Right. Yeah, it's just you know, what can you do with that one? You know, you gotta just love who she is for sure. Yeah, that's um, like long milk parmesan shit right there. Like, it's, <laughs> it's it's good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> but like you know the you know, and I don't, I just don't suggest. That's like if we wanted to put them in a category of like professional and ro like you know, like yeah. rookie type of thing. Like you gotta start easy. Don't don't go killing yourself because that's what drives people away from it. And like the numbers weren't right or whatever you got to tell your, you know, your boss manager in that type of situation. Um, I tell people, it's like, you know, ah, every time you got to like lose it to, to, to know it type of thing. And, 
Yeah. Um, just work with an easier one. It's just so much easier. And easier ones, yeah. Strawberry banana, sour D. I don't know. Do you, what other ones that are easy in your guys' eyes? Mean, you said Death Star or De um, I'd say Death, Death Star is exactly the same as Death Coast. Like and yeah, and Death Coast, <laughs> Death Coast. So like Death Star is just since he started sour diesel. So Death Coast is just since he started sour diesel back across to East Coast sour again. So it's just sour DBX one is what it is. And then the more sour you bring into it, yeah, the more you'll find. I'm sure, yeah, yeah just at least selection me. wise, you're just gonna because he he made Death Coast Diesel. It's Pips Weed actually on Instagram. Uh, it's a buddy of mine, kind of out this way, and uh, he uh, yeah, he he basically released the Death Coast Diesel for his seed stock, and it was just back crossed to sour again. So it's essentially just sour diesel BX2. And I had a buddy that ran through some of them, and they were just spot on sour. You know, like, find that all day in it. So yeah. if it's what you want, like, yeah, and yeah, for hash, yeah, definitely a good one. Yes. Yeah. Especially if you like the effect of that and the flavor. It's Because, I, yeah, I definitely want, I want I, yeah, the, the, the terpenes, too, like, categorized, too, into, like, certain, um, like, you know, easier hard level like type yeah, just level, yeah yeah 100%. You know? um so that's something else it's kind of like we need to make like kind of a, a you know a time or just like a line of kind of like categorizing this shit because it's it's nothing that you could find anywhere else but it's that's in true. our brain. yeah unless you just dive and still yeah it's not like it's basically looking through instagram comments at this point as opposed to looking through forums which is a lot <laughs> harder to <laughs> find a so search engine simple. to look through instagram comments you know it's definitely yeah. <laughs> they're still really vague like so yeah and yeah 100 percent. so yeah we need to make <laughs> yeah. the hash encyclopedia for sure for sure yeah yeah, yeah I, like, I agree I like a lot about that. terpene playing into that because terpene plays huge into the trichome rigidity and just like how right. the texture of the plant's gonna be you know fresh I, yeah, live dry like however i've found a lot that are strawberry mm -hmm. related that have that easy you know texture too um so that's just pretty cool to know like i mean i'm sure there isn't there's some out there but more or less it seems like they're pretty reliable with the banana og anything that kind of to mention that that's why i wish yeah, adam was here um but yeah definitely sure, a good one it seems like I grew the banana dog, which is the banana OG they had with the SFB black dog from Bio Vortex. And yeah, that, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Those drip like water. There's, there's some of like, yeah, the most, Oh, man. Just, just so good, like juiciest resinous plants that, yeah, make the hash just like That's crazy. That's what I've been smoking on, but in flower form. The yeah. Banana. Hell, yeah. Yeah, That's but that's like, good. Yeah, it has like. Yeah, a, I forgot you run black dog crosses. Candy kind of thing to it. It's nice. Yeah, that's, yeah I enjoy it, that. It's just got that good head that makes it like really easy and like things that it crosses with. And black dog is too. SFV has some hash in it too. So, I mean, you got to bring yeah. strains together. And I mean, that's what probably Instagram will show you. It's like the first thing is like, what are hash strains? And you start looking at what's already made out of hash and like papayas oh, yeah. and a lot, there's a lot of fruit and a lot less gas and i feel like it's because of just of the consumers and obviously yeah. the turf profile like for connoisseurs like ourselves i feel like we go towards the gassier ones the earthier ones the muskier ones and then there's the you know people that really want fruit and just like on a consumer level fruit is a lot more appealing to like whoa you know and, yeah, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that loudness too, especially like, skunks and shit are offensive. Um, so yeah, I think that's like, like a huge part of it. Earlier, like the with the OGs, like not not doing well. I mean, it probably also has to do with the fact that certain profiles, certain terpenes, are just not doing well in water. You know, or have water soluble terps as well. Yeah, and I have a theory on that, and no one's kind of corrected me or tell me if I'm right or wrong I mean I love to hear your input um but all right sativas are grown more towards the equator the equator rains more often it has like a torrential downpours that's like where jungles and shit you know the plant is used to having rain put down on it the afghanis the cushions that make better hash are up in the mountains of the deserts that have really harsh you know temperature swings and winds with dust and things that m will have to be a fatter denser head to survive you know their climate 
and the same so the ones down at the uh, like at the equator seem to be like more water soluble where they can like they just like you touch them they just like pop and like you know like it's just yeah they just melt away and like that's probably what they're maybe used to doing and like how their own you know long flowering period type of style is like they reproduces resin i've i've heard of this too in the tropics where they do charos on these haze plants um since they take 16 weeks to flower they get multiple harvests of charos off these plants Um, oh shit yeah it's pretty freaking grow or because they're missing surfaces uh no because it regrows it regrows and of course like yeah yeah, the buds you know on a haze plant will grow a lot bigger than a like then you know uh, a cush little cush plant so right yeah you know, it's it's crazy but that's my theory you know of like it's seeing awesome. these strains and why they're different and stuff is because they come from different places that handle totally yeah, yeah. different climates oh, yeah. yeah it allows them to breed that into them over time for sure and just like for yeah sure. the the ability of that that's like yeah that was a bomb right there bro that was definitely like solid information for sure yeah <laughs> I, yeah, dude, I've been thinking about that all the time because, like, I really want to grow haze, but I can't in my backyard. I've even made soil, you know, from all the surrounding plants and abundant trees and whatever, you know, a pack of poop and all this, and it turns my pH higher. I have a higher pH because of all this, and that's okay. You know, I find the phenos that like it and that adapt with my with my uh, climate and everything here. But I'll tell you right now, sativas like a lower pH. They like, you know, more acidic soil, which I'm built more alkaline soil now. And and so I'm almost pushing myself away from that. Um, and I got to figure out like a way to build a bed just for haze or something and like dep it. I don't know. But yeah. Right. Definitely dep it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's the only way because, of course, yeah. October comes around like a like a bat out of hell around here and the thing will never make it. <laughs> It's crazy. It's ruthless. Right, dude, it just goes. Dude, Halloween's up, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude, just... I can't even get some things to Halloween anymore because we're so low yeah. in the valley that the swing of uh, temperatures. We've actually seen frost. I mean, a lot of Instagram, you know, pictures have been frosty the last couple of years around harvest time, and yeah. I don't know what they're. You know, weather's changing. Whatever, whatever. But it's uh, it's making a difference here. And like the middle of October comes around and it's negative it's oh not negative it's like 20 degrees it's 19 degrees and it kills the plant so the resin at that point too is diminishing because i know the flowers are diminishing things are <sighs> definitely going downhill and like how to save that is i think almost the flowers were never going to make it to maturity you got to take it for hash you know and then you're then you're left with like well it's not maybe fully mature and i really like pushing my plants <clears throat> full maturity but it really just comes down to the smoke and whether or not it's good enough to be, you know, enjoyed with friends and family and consumers and everything, you know, but that's how that's, I feel like a part of it too. And knowing when to choose that right time and with the genetic in that, in the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, I, I like how like you guys have been selecting for what's like good in, in your region and it makes sense. Like sometimes you can't, you know, sometimes you can't grow like, you know, passion fruit and guava in Oregon, you know? So like, right. you know, you so grow, be- like, yeah, I feel it. I, you know, and that's what makes everyone's, uh, it, everyone should look at that first, not like, Oh, what do you grow? And I want to grow it. Or what, a, what is LA growing? I just want to grow the fire hype. Now I was like, really <laughs> fine. Maybe my, maybe find the seeds of the, the hype shit and then find the Pino that works for you. That's going to end up doing you a huge favor and a long-term thing. And plus you're really going to like it because it's going to be your own special little, you know, Fino that you've gotten attached to. And I think that's what makes, you know, um, also a really special plant that people enjoy yeah. when smoking. They're like, whoa, you know, you're an awesome grower. This is a great run. It's because of that, you know, that connection that you build into it. That, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's the thing about like OGs and stuff and, and more gassy stuff that I realize is, you know, it might it might be a lot because of the strain too, but like also mainly because of the selection of these early like clone onlys, you know, is where like the selection was limited and was for what was good for smoking. Right. Um, Typically like, you know, in smaller spaces, like not running, you know, like full plant hashes. So 
if the original selection of like all that, you know, like uh, if you could look at a lot of them and stuff, I'm sure there's like hashers in there, but it's, you know, just like humans, like, you know, like everybody can do anything, you know, and, and it just like takes a certain mind, you know, and like, I feel like seeds of cannabis do the same thing. You just gotta choose what, they, what they're what they actually like good at, you know, like mm -hmm. find that out. And, yeah, uh, but I, like you said, I think it does take a, a big population. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like what a lot of people just don't, right? You don't, the resources, the time, the space, the effort. Right. To, to do that kind of selection. Uh, Especially like you're saying about OGs and stuff, all those old strains, you know, it's like yeah. everybody was growing in a, in a house or something, trying to hide it all anyways and trying to. Right trying to be smart about it and not go to jail trying to do what they're doing in the first place so exactly that's yeah. what i find exciting about cross <clears throat> strains is that like their offspring almost are like as good as them you know like and yeah. you might be able to find ones where the flower is just as good as like like a chem d but like has a little bit something different but it's just as exciting and really really nice and also hashes really really well yeah, um, that's what's crazy for sure. And it can happen. And um, yeah, and now is the time to where like we're really fortunate that, you know, we're going to be able to look at a lot of different weed strains and know a lot of info because of internet stuff and and like, yeah. you know, getting new seeds all the time and whatever through banks. And like, it's pretty cool. And, and like, we're going to find a lot of characters that we didn't assume to hash that are going to hash. And it's really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, just open the channel for it, like you're saying, you know, crossing it in the offspring alone, and then, like, you can open up recessive traits that even was already underlying in the one of the parents, you know, and it's just, like, yeah. you could take something that's not going to wash and completely make that flavor or effect even follow through, but have, like, a better washing plant than that flavor and effect from the cultivar that you kept for flour because it wouldn't wash, you know, so. Right. Totally. totally so like what's a keeper plant well what are you trying to get you know <laughs> like what is a keeper plant depending on what you want like and oh, i yeah. think yeah now selections can be had like now everybody can like search through a lot of seeds now you know and and start breeding there's definitely not a drought of seeds out there you definitely yeah. got that right, <laughs> right. So, like, it's just wild like uh, there's so much to see and like, yeah, even some of the nostalgic weed, like as good as it is because it's nostalgic, like, is it as good as some new strains? Like, even though that's not what I fully think, but you know, like, it's just like, there's so much new stuff. It's yeah, really even just on the consumer, you know, it's like <laughs> everybody's gonna be different. It's like, for yeah. me, like what I, I always see people calling stuff mids and for me, mids is stuff that's unethically grown and grown with something that I can't align myself with, especially pesticides or something like that. That's going to harm an individual. But uh, if the effect doesn't work for me, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work for somebody else. You know, like black dog's a great example. Black dog, like all those lavender style strains that have that line of law, heavy terpene profile in them. Mm -hmm. They usually for me, I don't like the effect of them. I used to get a lot of Mindo Perp and like good granddaddy purple back in the day and had a lot of friends that loved that flower and said it straight put them to sleep and it just did not affect me the same way. And like our endocannabinoid systems are all different. So yeah, how we affect our, like get affected from cannabis is going to be differently. And like sure. what I always loved about Black Dog Kush, like the selection that's out here in Michigan, I've been thankful to watch and stuff. Cause like I always kind of looked up the BioVortex and just like his his like standard of what he's, what he's doing for people. And it mm -hmm. seems really cool, you know, and just his breeding program, you know? So, uh, but yeah, it's a, for me, the selection, the flower just does not do well for me. I've even had it grown in living soil one time where I thought it was going to really just be like a better effect of a flower from it. And yeah. uh, the hash though hits so good for me. Like the effect of it's the best I've had of any type of like line of law flavor like that. The hash just like, it gives me such a good, like a, just a good high from it that I'm really in like I enjoy you know and uh but even the point of crossing it like the day that I got that living soil grown uh black dog I got some Athene sour to black dog that biovortex made and that shit put me under the table after I tried to smoke a bowl of the black dog like I was like the black dog was straight <laughs> flavor but it just didn't hit it was like smoking air it was so good and like flavorful 
but yeah. it was just like you know nothing there that made me like yeah. you know feel the effect of the flower so i feel that i feel that too i mean definitely like i feel a lot of people eight out of ten people probably will agree that the purple like type of ones don't get them as like baked type of you know just that type you know not as high so there's something about that, you know, and like wondering what does that bring to the table when it is like, uh, what's medicinal about that, that we, we aren't knowing, I guess, what's the under, yeah, the secret about the purple, <laughs> you know, we're not getting stoned, but what are we getting out of it? That's right. a good question. What's the use? Yeah. Like, yeah. I feel it though. I, I, you know, and like some of the purples, like I do get a good, great flavor. Um, it's you know maybe a little bit more of an intense lavender or something you know it goes down a different path but it is still close um you know they all have a different time of the day for me since i have so many different strains i feel like i just it's a vibe it's it's a moment it's oh, a yeah. song it's a smell in the air it's like all <laughs> these different things that get me to want to smoke something <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, talking about the smorgasbord of terps over there is what he's really talking about. He's just like, I got it. He's like, I don't know what jar to reach for, but you know, he's like, there's one there during the day that I usually reach for it's, about noon every day, high noon. I'm smoking this jar <laughs> for sure. I mean, yeah, probably you know, maybe a strawberry guava. I really like the strawberry banana papaya, and that's mixed well, and like that's one that gets the flavor rocking and everything. And yeah, that's a good one um but damn yeah there's there's a good handful it's hard to choose sometimes in a good way yeah that's a, i was gonna say that's a good thing man that's the point yeah i definitely stay, can't say the same staying blessed for sure um okay cool so yeah let's let's rein this back into the to the drying a little bit and you know one of the things that i've heard from various people that basically is kind of almost like a downside to dry, air drying is the amount of space and the conditions that you need to maintain the resin in once <clears throat> you've sieved it and maybe received it or whatever you've done. The condition of after like it's dry. Yeah. I'm just saying like the amount of space typically I've heard oh. needed or oh. like keeping the condition yeah. just right is kind of one of the downsides. Definitely. It's definitely hard. A lot of people tend to like, you know, it, it's just running the proper equipment and make sure it's all like up to date too and stuff because you don't want your stuff to fail on you. Um, but the amount of space really is the more space, I think the better just because then there's more, you know, uh, room volume or what I'm trying to say, like there's not as much to be like, you know, the moisture to to bounce with to balance with to go back into the air with so um it's oh my damn my damn dog stop um so i feel like that yo come on stop um he or it's not he the the, the has you know it's bad sorry um i i you know i fill up a whole wall a whole like 20 foot wide wall um i have like two shelves on and I put, you know, I do it in the pizza boxes and I put parchment paper down and line it like that. Um, so that also like adds a little space. I try to like, you know, so I could stack boxes and stuff. Um, you got, yeah, kind of think I seen Frenchie kind of do it like on parchment paper, but on the shelf that yeah. like, you know, has like the, the metal shelf that kind of open and exposed. And I just didn't feel safe and kind of comfortable doing that. Like, I don't know, like a lot of people are just different. And of course, yeah, I, and I, I drop hash on the ground. I've never done that, but I feel like I drop hash on the ground doing stuff like for that. For sure. So. I mean, that's how I feel too. And yeah, so looks, I always looks, feel like- It looks like it would be well. It would do well for space and, you know, for stuff like mm -hmm. that. Especially if you're washing in the same room you're drying in. Like, yeah, definitely. Yeah, like, and yeah, I just feel like the pizza box is also good, you know, for moisture level too, so- just to add that in there too, to like just absorb as much moisture as you can in that real yeah. quicker. Do you worry uh, especially about like the box being, like you were talking about stacking them, the box being closed, like, and not having, or the resin not having enough room to. Airflow? To breathe, yeah, yeah, the airflow. Okay. That's actually a good good point that you say that because I don't think we ever picked up on like how many grams do you sieve into that like size of a box. 
three grams, three to five grams <laughs> right. is all I do. So like, it's a very little bit. And like, I've seen a lot of people overdo it. And you know, when you're going like a lot, it's, you're ruining it. You're ruining it right there and in there. You want to go a very little bit and just dust it. Um, so when then I close the box, I don't feel like there is a problem. There's, you know, there's the moisture level in that box is not high really at all, especially after I wick out most of it. And we go through that series of steps and the temperature's just right. And we're pushing it through the sieve and it's like, you know, cracking through and, you know, or whatever. Um, that right there is like, it's all kind of like almost at the lowest moisture level right there. And then the, I think the cardboard just helps. And I use fresh pizza boxes. I've ordered, you know, bulk off of um, whatever. And um, so that to me is like, you know, really just three grams, five grams at most. Um, keeping it very little bit so you're not having that problem and then my dehu is kind of faced um, where the air blows about 15 feet and then hits that whole wall where all the boxes are so that to me is something I've lined up and made sure that it works so you know all the pizza boxes aren't tucked tight I've actually just like just rest them closed and the sides are like slightly open so that's another thing. It's not really fully closed. There's definitely an open side. So even if you're stacking it and then the holes on top of each box, like, you know, the breathable holes for the pizza, not to steam and get sweaty. Right. Dude, I always pop those just for the hell of it. And Ken, yeah. you, you were saying you were working like on almost like a metal baking sheet type thing that I've seen other people use. Yeah. So I'm on baking sheets and a uh, bacon rack. Um, but I'm, I'm in a pretty small room. Um, the room is pretty small <laughs> and we fit two bacon racks in there and pretty much what the objective to do is to have the room dry, you know, including the hash, but the room needs to dry. Um, so if I really dry out my hash, like really hard before I start saving it. And then I continue to break it. That's why I really like breaking it down more as I'm drying. But it's only because of situation. Um, I mean, it just depends on whatever like system you have at your spot. It's going to be a little bit different. And you have to respond to that. And, and that's the other thing, you know. So ours is like I wake out the moisture as much as I possibly can. Um, kind of not to shock it too much, you know, and then um, break it down, and I put them on sheets with parchment, and um, and then just dry out the room. Just try try to dry out the room and and leave that room, pretty much until it's done. <laughs> yeah, and then you mentioned earlier, three days or two days. Yeah. Was that you? Yeah, it could be three to four days. Okay. And how about you guys? Do you have anything kind of different that you go by? I can see three days. I've seen three days here too. I've actually seen yeah. like pretty quick and like the coldest temperature in my house. I've seen it, I think in two days, but like, I still was like, Oh, I, you know, test, test smoke. And it was like decent, but I'll let it go still an extra like day or two to be safe. And, but yeah, it's pretty it's crazy on when you can break it down fine enough, it can really dry quicker than you think. You know, but each of yeah. our rooms are different. That is the thing. Like, my yeah, room is, true. you know, a lot bigger than yours, I feel, Cam. And then it's, like, it uh -huh. makes that that difference of, like, how much moisture is already in the room, trans, you know, furring yeah. into dry air. And, like, that that matters. Like, you got to yeah. have that volume. But yeah, every, um, single, every single situation has a different response to it that that, that is required. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. though. So it's really hard to us this I feel like to say almost one thing too. It's like it matters, yeah, with square footage too, and then the, it'll change with it's bigger or small. And obviously, how much we wick, and we can sit here and even try to say that we wick about the same, but our description of what we're like, how how we're describing how much moisture there could be, you know, different than each other's, you know. So yeah, yeah. And Cam, I was going to ask you like, what's for a good question on wicking like. What's your timeline of like when you put it down? What's the shortest amount of time that you've seen, and what's the longest amount of time that you've seen? 
it sitting yeah you know so like people can get a window of like you know kind of where to judge it cool all right yeah so um for a really like putty textured uh strain like uh i had to wash this great pie and it was super just like soft resin that will easily molds to whatever pressure is held to it and it also it needs a colder temperature to free to freeze right so it will still be in seepable form in like a lower 20s uh fahrenheit right um which most other strains will have frozen pebbles um so like you need to get it to that and um wait shit what was the question <laughs> the timeline of like the oh, yeah. moisture level um that like is the shortest like all right you put it on the wick right when's the quickest you would take it off and when's the longest you would take it off i guess and you were saying which strain that one is probably the quicker one that you were just explaining the great pie because that to yeah. me is like ogkb exactly so just like ogkb those are extremely quick and that those are the ones where i throw extra like paper towel underneath it even though i didn't need that much like and i'll reuse that for another time and like um yeah those ones need to be worked immediately and they're pretty much worked if i put them in the right refrigeration right away like they can be worked in like fucking five minutes and then like but they really have to let that water go because those strains if they don't want let the water go and they don't connect with that pressure like we were talking about earlier with that pressure allowing the water to go through they can take a while and then once the water goes through it's like sealed already yeah and yeah I feel, it, five minutes is kind of what i was feeling right. too like on ogkb it's that it's really a hit or miss really quick that five minutes you gotta be yeah. on top you cannot leave that room <laughs> when that moment is happening it's like you will seriously lose it really quick yeah um, it's kind of how barber butt will be some rounds yeah be on that really realm sticky, of just like that greasy ones and you know those are the, to me the 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 challenging ones make it really fun to like have that challenge you know it, it keeps your skills really sharp on that side of things too right um and but then so the opposite of that question like is like how long you know and i i think i've seen i timed it um 30 minutes i got some sandy golden strawberries to sit on that wick thing you know on the wick good. that yeah. yeah for about 30 minutes and i came back to it and i was like pop you know hit it with the spoon it just broke like that you know perfect wet sand right and I was like, oh, good to go, son. And it's already tr practically dried and stuff. It's <laughs> yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. See, dude, yeah, I was going to touch on that when we were talking about it. Even with your talking about with pizza boxes, I've dried like that as well. And, like, the wick level and the moisture level at the point that you're putting it into the box to dry is so minimal. Like, I could dab yeah. ash 12 hours later for sure. It's not going to sizzle. I'm not saying that's not dry. But, like, right. I don't know. The biggest right. way to do it at that point, I feel like, is you just, like, can feel it. You can feel like wet ash. I've smoked wet ash because I used to only right. be able to wash Another so much. Way. So I'm like, oh, I want to try this flavor. Like, no, totally, totally. And yeah, like 12 hours. You know, I've said it in 24 hours. I definitely smoked it and it was fine. But like, I give it an extra. Just you know, some bigger chunks might fall in there. You want to do the receive at that point. That's where right. you hit the receive definitely. button and break those bigger ones down smaller, and the smaller ones get smaller, and everyone's just like, whoa, even quicker yes. to dry. But that was, you know, uh, another way to tell is take a spoonful of it or whatever, finger press it, some parchment paper, hold it up to the light, and you can see some swirls, like the marble, the cloudiness. Yeah, little, yeah. You know? yeah. yeah that's yep. the moisture. And then if you let yep. that sit out, I, I've let it sit out next to, like, you know, the direct TV, like, internet box or whatever, and that shit, the radiate, like, it just dried it out. like two And the hash then is just like an oil puddle. And it's like, ah, oh, dude. Fire. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you know that's a great way to kind of just yeah kind of just tell real quick you know take a little sneak peek yeah if it sizzles a little really it's only just a a tiny bit of water um it ain't gonna even hurt you it's just like shit but yeah. be aware of that and like test your product then before you you know feel like you're good to jar it that's you know that's the key don't jar it too early um because you'll ruin the whole batch you know, oh, yeah. or whatever. That's yeah. Huge. So you really test it, you know, and, and just know your levels of like, you know, when you're jarring shit up, I guess, like, you know, coming 
down after you, it's dry are you going to be drawing it in like a, a humid room then like are you going to change rooms like i don't know you know that's a factor of it too um but yeah that's good i'm just glad we answered that question because i'm sure that helps a lot of people um, yeah i used to gauge it kind of like a, i swear like you could just taste like a vapor or not taste but you know it was just like a hotter breath yeah. dab from like wet hash you know it was yeah. like yeah, it was like you're in a sauna dabbing but not like you know not nearly like that but in the sense of yeah, yeah, kind of totally. what it was like <laughs> It almost like skips across my tongue, like like skipping a rock on the on the water, and just like the flavor, just you know. And then, yeah. and then like when it's really cured and when it's really dry and perfect, it's like diving into that water, and you're just submerged in that overwhelming, like dank, bold flavor. I like to, rem I always like to kind of explain it as bold, because like it just makes a mouthful, you know, like on the good on the good hashes like that that are to me hand dried like gives you more of that bold it's kind of where i'm going with like the I'm, the sharper like tip of the tongue is where i get mostly like a lot of the freeze dried because it seems like it didn't ever see a warmer temperature than you know 30 degrees so yeah. it just kind of reacted different it's never seen yeah it's, like, it's kind of different what is so. your what are you guys opinions if you if you remember it all like back uh with water hash when I, I saw it from Matt Rise, I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure if he's, like, the guy that popularized it, but, like, cold curing hash, like, just basically, like, jarring up your water hash. This is before rosin, I think. So, like, just basically dabbing water hash, but waiting two weeks of refrigerating it before smoking it. And he said it would bring out more of the flavor. Yeah. And, like, I, I don't know if that's, like, placebo, because, like, you're, like, hiding a jar of hash from yourself to not smoke it for two fucking weeks or, like, minimally smoke it. And so well, it's, like... The thing, I yeah, no, I feel you. And then how to really figure that one out is jar 20 different, you know, of the same jars of hash and open each one every month and really indulge and know yeah, whether yeah. or not it's changing. And that's what I have done. And I have definitely seen ups and downs, like a roller coaster on all different genetics. Like it's all strain dependent. Some do get better, some get worse. Some have like a like a, a good peak and then like I've seen a year you know I've left the jar sitting in my freezer negative 20 degrees for a year and you wouldn't think it changed and I pop it open looks the same smells slightly like fainter and then when I smoked it I'm like oh it's definitely lost you know the flavor that it once had which was like yeah I remember way better so um I think it all depends on the strain and then whether or not like yeah, just the timeline of each strain, which we don't know any of those answers yet either. Like, how long does the strawberry banana take to become amazing, or when does it become, you know, planned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's even you like know, fucking flowers, the same way. I think that's why we don't see many OGs and things like that on the shelf, is because the shelf life of flower like that is not that good. Right. So it's just <laughs> not going to be able to stay, stay around you know, long. Like, is, and then is the cold cure better? What is the cold cure? Is it is it 35 degrees like the refrigerator, or is it – you know, zero degree or True. negative 20, you yeah, know, like, and where do we thing. take this? Yeah. 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 35 sure. degrees to me is, is a good slow, like slow marinate that like, I do like to enjoy the hash after a little bit of time marinating at that 35. And I think it does cold cure. Um, so I could see where he's getting that. And then we're talking connoisseurs like ourselves really do find those flavors that, that pop and really make our eyes like, you know, open and say, what was that? And what, what happened to that? Why, why they did that, you know? And that's, yeah, you know, th but there's no answers to say which one is the tech to do it for all techs. There's not like, Oh yeah. You know, yeah. A hundred percent. Like, yeah, yeah that's, that's the thing. And that's, you know, a lot of back to the point of us finding our own lane of what we need to do. It's like, you know, yeah. it's like, and you it's can't tell everybody what would work for them. To know, yeah, they know what you know. You got to find what works for you because it's all different, and <clears throat> yeah, that's for sure. I like, I like the thought of that. And Brandon, you brought up this idea of like once it's done wicking, you hit it with the spoon and it cracks. And Camden and I spoke recently, and we went pretty into depth about that. And Cam, you brought up this idea of like a, there's a particular sound that it makes to you when you do that when you hit the patty there's a sound that kind of resonates that makes you know that you know it's time to pull it 
Yeah, um, absolutely. When, when, when you hit it, it, it seems more like a solid than rather than something that has some give. It's more of a sharp solid, and that's what I'm looking for. And then the other sound part is when you break up and you have your first sieve, when that hash hits the sheet pan, there's a very specific, or like even just a sheet of paper, you can hear the specific like sound that you can hear that like the, the moisture was wicked out really nicely. And you mm-hmm. mainly hear that on the ones you can wick out all the way with no rushing. You know what I mean? The really nice ones and with that like, um, like the nice sandy textures that we're talking about. Like those, you, you can perfectly wick those things out to being so dry before you even sieve it. And when you sieve it, it just creates a sound that you know that it's a heavy, like, uh, drier hash hitting paper. Like you, you it, can it sounds of- like cookie crumbs. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like sprinkle like- out cookie crumbs. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it, it seems like it, it falls down easier when, when it's like moist and puffy, right? It, it like, it doesn't fall down as hard. Yeah, it totally does. I know what you mean. Yeah. And that, like, I guess a good way to know if you're like, if it's too wet, if you're sieving it, and if it's too wet, if it comes out in any bit long, like a strain, like a little, like a little pasta, right. you know, like a little pasta, a little noodle. Um, exactly. Cause it has then moisture and it's like, I noticed that like when it's dry, it flakes through it flakes and it's like really crumbly. Mm-hmm. So that's like, I know what you mean, but I always have my music on and I'm like, wait, I never heard the sound, but I, now I can think about what <laughs> I know what you mean. That's good shit. Yeah, good I, shit. I definitely get what you're talking about for sure, but I'm right there with Brandon and just being zoned out anytime it comes to your time and just kicking in some headphones and getting in the zone. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, but for like somebody who's brand new to it, that, that would be an interesting, like, you know sensory kind of learning experience that like does it sound right or what does that sound when it hits the parchment you know yeah true especially even drying up like i feel like once the hash is dry like it, it's got like its own sound like when you like go to take that bacon sheet and take the parchment and peel it right. up you know and all the hash yeah. goes crumbling into the middle and you like you can watch it separate you know like yeah yeah, no, that's cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think we've had a pretty good, like, in-depth talk about the drying process. Um, is there anything that anybody would like to add, whether it's about drying or not? Uh, uh, maybe to just like, yeah, hopefully this will give people the idea to start air drying hash more, you know, and like definitely possible i've i'm i've heard stories of somebody that i know is a farmer that uh i don't know if i lost you guys for a second but yeah like i i've heard stories of a farmer that literally in his in his grow room just breaks down his grow room and air dries all his ash in his grow room with his mini split in there just gets it down to 60 and washes his whole rooms in between harvests so (laughs) doable there's a way to do it yeah yeah, if it doesn't teach you patience, I don't know what will. Like, it definitely, you know. And that's what makes you feel more humble as a person. And it's like you and you know that craft is worth something, you know. You're learning something that's going to live on forever. It's like learning how to ride a bike. You don't forget it. And you really benefit from it. Yeah, I think having that experience with the resin, uh, even though I don't have it, sounds like it just gives you this good, like, base knowledge you know that even if you were to transition into freeze dryers uh, or if you are working with freeze dryers you have an idea of what the resin uh, would do in, in, in different circumstances and it almost gives you a different comparison or a different viewpoint of freeze dried resin you know so the more you know about anything I think probably the better but this is like I said, it's it's kind of becoming a somewhat <coughs> obsolete thing. I think it'll always be around. I think there'll be a group of people that are interested in in air drying. Um, but the freeze dryer seems pretty simple and kind of becoming the go-to thing. 
Yeah. I which I, I'm really I, I think it's pretty cool that the freeze dryer has expanded the solventless like hash um interest so much. And and I, I think that's really awesome. But um yeah, definitely air drying has become much more rare and uh I feel like uh yeah, I don't know. Pe people just don't really uh like think of it that much or anything like that it's i think there's more hash because of a freeze dryers though you know what i'm saying like more people yeah. took that leap sure. to like sure you have to spend a little more money right off the rip like because you could air dry hash just to, like depending the time of the year you know like you could just air dry hash and not have to have any type of temperature controlled room and produce quality hash so um mm -hmm. i think that's part of it like one thing I that i did want to ask that i didn't think of was like Headhunter Extracts. I don't know if you know of him at all, Camden. I think he's out your way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know Jay. I know he upstairs. air dries yes. and freeze dries <laughs> and shit. And mm -hmm. I've spoke with him, and he's told me that his like his rosin squishes that he gets lower yields on rosin from squishing freeze dried hash as opposed to air dried hash. Oh, okay. So I don't know if you have any experience on that because I have very little experience. Like it's um, been years since I air dried or freeze dried hash. Like so. I actually don't because years. like my rosin squishing experience is pretty low um but i feel like brandon you you, you squish all, all of yours yeah not not all of it um just some just randomly like some more than others but i now i've um seen like most of them like of the like the clones that i've grown um and i've seen the side by side now i think it's like when i pull out some hash out of the freeze dried um or out of the freezer from the freeze dried and I finger press it, it has like, just, it's not glassy. It's not, it still has like a little bit of clouds like in it. It's not the moisture, but cause it goes away too. And it's not like swirl. It's just this weird, like still cold type of state or something, you know? And then when I have the hand dried, even if I pull it out of the, the, the freezer and I press it, it turns into like stained glass. And I don't know what that exact difference what I'm seeing is and like why the freeze dryer does that and why the hand dry does. That. I mean, the hand dried is already, I feel like just, I don't know, just like dried. Machine more of it. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. if you think about like the cake, the layer of, you know, chunk of hash in the freeze dryer is like a patty and the patty now is getting like dried from the top through it. You know, it's like the top is going to be more dry than the bottom. It just always seems like that's how it has to be. Yeah, sure. um, you know, um, so I feel like it's just something that's, you know, really hard to say in that sense. But I do think when you're squishing then the hand dried, yeah, like whatever that difference is, it's not in the way. So then the hand dried would, would spit. Um, I've only pressed a hand dried like a few times and very little bit of it because I, cher I cherish it so much. Um, but yeah i mean jay yeah jay would probably have the most knowledge because of how much he put pumps out for you know the the market yeah so. yeah yeah. that's that's just what he spoke with me on about it and i was just i was just curious like at that point <clears throat> like is the labor worth the extra rosin and because if the rosin is no different but you're just getting slightly different True. yields is Completely. it like is it worth the labor to squish it or like or yeah. to, to air dry it to squish it or you know so hard to say and it's really that it all didn't know if you'd ever done that but i assumed you know it's like you're probably air drying small scale and just air drying like the hash that you want to puff on like how it is so it's like yeah honestly yeah that's more or less what i do because of just consumers not understanding you know the little bit you know off white uh it's either amber oh, or yeah, 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 yeah. you know it's just not white They're, they don't believe something you know they, I, they don't understand like how we do so what I don't even have time to argue with them at this point. I actually have in the past <laughs> and you know, it really drove me up the wall. Um, that's a whole nother episode, you know, um, <laughs> for real. And then, you know, after that point I said, I'll start using the freeze dryer because whatever, I got to pay the bills. So um, it just comes down to that. Like I know what I enjoy and the homies that come over, you know, I whip out the hand dried stuff and like we, we, we indulge into it. Like, the fine wine that it is you know it's it's good right. yeah yeah and I'll hopefully love. more pick up, more people pick up on that from this episode and like kind of see that like 
you know, the cool thing is like, you know, like we're smoking hand dried, the, you know, the connoisseurs, the, the ones that are creating this stuff because we smoked, you know, all of it, you know, before it's ever got to you, we smoked 10 other ones, you know, it's like, we, we, we seen it all. And we, we know that our lungs don't lie to us and our throats don't lie. And like these things, you know, but it's a convenience thing to really like load up a tray and throw it in a machine. Dude, and it's honestly it. beautiful pulling out that much hash, honestly, like off a oh, single yeah. tray. Like, you oh, know, don't like, get me wrong. My wrist would be insane. broken. If I had to make <laughs> as much hash as I just did last season, um, by frick with hand drying, my wrist would be broken. You wouldn't even see me shoveling these last few weeks. Yeah, I've oh thought I, I thought I'd get like uh, I've thought about freeze drying like my rosin pools and stuff, but uh, I still don't right now. But I mean, I've gotten a pretty good hand on it all. But I've thought about like how I could get like carpal tunnel from Stephen Hash. I'm like, well, that's way doper than sitting at a computer and typing on a typing on a keyboard. <laughs> oh, yeah. though, no, you, like, yeah, you earn your stripes doing that for sure. <laughs> I've actually, you know? um, I actually have gotten carpet tunnel from seeping hash before and had to wear the, the wrist thing Brace. for a while. <laughs> the, yeah, what is it called? <laughs> the, the wrist. I think it's like a brace type of brace almost. Right? Yeah, I had to wear that shit, and then I was helping out doing that KNF outdoor farm and shit, and I was just like, fuck, man. But <laughs> it can happen if you're seeping too much hash, like. <sighs> It can happen. You get that huge lump on your wrist. Oh yeah, this, from it sitting this, like these are real problems. <laughs> these are real problems. Yeah, it, it comes up. Ash <laughs> problems. It's crazy. First world and probably third world too. I mean, there's definitely the people in third <laughs> beating on the drums. You probably get tired as hell doing that shit too, and you have to. Yeah, I mean, you don't ever know back. though. We could all be having a dry hash with a toothpick in the future. You know what I'm saying? So it's like. <laughs> You no. never know, man. There might not be any more kitchen stores to get these from. I gotta have yeah. that guy on the toothpick tick. Dude, yeah, you gotta find that guy. That's gotta hey. go down. I wanna try his hat. Hey, cool. It's amazing. Well, guys, I appreciate you all hanging out. Again, we got Camden from Pool Extracts. You can follow him at Pool Extraction. Is that right, Camden? I don't yeah, I'm pretty sure it's full extractions. Full extractions, yeah. yeah. And then Brandon at Kush Kirk and Michael at Macho Melts. And of course, you can follow us at the Hashish Inn, I N N. Um, yeah, dudes, I appreciate you so much. I think people will hopefully appreciate this and dig it. So we'll see how it goes. We cool. appreciate awesome. it, man. Big time. Appreciate you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome hanging out with you guys. Yeah, like yeah, big time. Always big love, fam. Big love. Peace out. All right. See Have you. a good day.